Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live stream and today we have a special guest, uh, Ben Chappell from the Narrowband channel. He has a channel here on YouTube which is all about astrophotography and he's an amateur astrophotographer uh, in Pennsylvania and he uses uh, Olympus cameras for a lot of his astrophotography and he has, a, he has an awesome channel if you want to know a lot of things about astrophotography. He goes into a lot of detail and has a lot of tutorials and uh, Ben actually uh, taught photography at college uh, to about 6,000 students. So um, hopefully it'll be a lot more articulate than I am <laughs> about a lot of things. Uh, but today I wanted to focus on astrophotography uh, for you guys and, um, you know, hear it from a professional. Because I get a lot of questions about astrophotography. Uh, well, not a lot, but time to time, you know. And my best answer is, you know, just shoot the moon and you know these are your basic settings but as far as doing star trails or deep sky type astrophotography and, and a lot of the more interesting pictures where you see these nebulas and the milky way it's not something i do you know on a regular basis or hardly at all so, and uh this is a good opportunity for all of us to learn more about how to do astrophotography starting with very basic gear to more advanced gear if you really want to get, get into it, um, you can really get some beautiful images um, that, you know, being a Star Trek fan and all, you'd think I'd be really into it, but <laughs> it, it's not an easy thing. It's a very technical field uh, or technical area of, of astro uh, photography, and uh, it requires a lot of planning, and there's a lot of steps involved to get the kind of images that we're going to be looking at today. But... Uh, we'll try and break it down for you and help you all get started with astrophotography. And then after sort of the basic presentation, uh, we'll do a live Q&A with Ben. Uh, so you can ask him questions a little bit more specifically, either if you have questions from the presentation that we do or, you know, if you have other questions that maybe we didn't address while we were talking there. And, and there'll be lots of resources down below in the, in the show description. There'll be a link to uh, Ben's channel, the Narrowband channel on YouTube. So definitely check that out. Subscribe. He's an he has an awesome channel. I can't believe he doesn't you know have more than more subscribers than I do. And also links to some of the things we'll be talking about to help you get started, uh, software and apps and online uh, resources. So without further ado, let me uh, go ahead and bring Ben on. And hey, Ben, how are you? <laughs> Afternoon, Rob. I just do, I want to make one correction. I didn't have six thousand students. I had about oh. three hundred out of a student body of six thousand. Oh, three hundred out of six thousand. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's typical of me. You know, I just people hear what they want to hear, right? <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I hopefully, yeah, I guess you heard the intro and everything. Um, so, you know, tell me more about yourself. How you got started in uh, astrophotography and uh, about your channel. All right. So when I was a teenager, I was out hunting coons with uh, binoculars and it was, it was getting, it was night, you know, and so I had binoculars with me and you see better with binoculars at night. And I turned those binoculars to the stars and I was really blown away with what I saw. And that's kind of how I started my interest in astronomy in general. And then uh, as I started reading more and had acquired a couple of telescopes, you know, I quickly learned that you know, those, those beautiful pictures that you see in books, you know, from NASA and so forth, you know, those, those colorful things, you can never see them with your human eye because your eye just isn't sensitive enough. So you have to take pictures of it in order to see it. And so I, as a teenager, I marched down to my local camera store, you know, Bob Novacell, and uh, I, I says to him, I was like, well, what camera do I need to do astrophotography? And he, he got this Olympus OM-1 out and put it in the counter and said, this is what you need. Wow. <laughs> because at the time, the Olympus OM cameras were the bee's knees. Because th this is the film days, mind you. There was there was no digital photography at the time. Yeah, that's shocking. I, I can't even fathom trying to do Astro on film. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the difference in sensitivity, I mean, like film is between 1% to 3% of actual photons of light that come in are actually mm -hmm. detected by the film. Uh, mm. You know, you're using silver halide processes versus, you know, your CCDs and your CMOS cameras today. Some of them are, you know, now approaching 90%. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So um, 
tell me tell me about your channel real quick so that people right. when they go check it out what to expect and um so i always I always try to fit three things into my my YouTube videos. You know, I always try to reference something else that I've already videoed. You know, so that way each video doesn't get extremely long. Long, and then I try to give some fun facts, and then I always try to give tips to make your life easier doing what I do, astrophotography. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the basics yeah. of it, and I try to focus on kind of three different things. You know, as nobody else had an Olympus oriented astrophotography channel, so you know that was one of the reasons why. I started the channel and then, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of the purposes of the channel. And then the other purpose was a uh, narrow band astrophotography, which I'm into, which hence the name of my channel, the narrow band channel. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I also use Apple computers for everything that I do. And so, you know, I, I like to focus anytime I do software based stuff in my channel, I focus mm -hmm. on the Apple side of things, you know, cause I, I when I was first getting into this, I was kind of like asking around. I was like, well, I use a Mac. I don't want to use a PC to do my astrophotography. And they all kind of laughed at me. I was like, oh, you can't do that. And I dug and dug and dug online. And I actually did find a lot of outlets and stuff to uh, to do that with a Mac mm -hmm. computer. So you, you can do it. You can actually do it with basically all free software. And some of the best software is available for the Mac. It's all cost. Right, right. Um but yeah, a lot of the, the free software, they're, they're multi-platform, right? You can do Windows, yeah. Apple, sometimes Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there'll be links down below for that stuff. And, and, you know, I think really one of the things that, one of the videos that really impressed me, you know, because I, I was interested in astrophotography, but it was a video where you had a wish list for Olympus. You know, this was mm. maybe six months ago. And uh, I thought that was amazing. So, you know, when you transfer, transition from film to digital and, and particularly into digital astrophotography, I mean, you had a choice of any camera system, mm -hmm. uh, but you found some advantages using the Olympus system uh, and Micro Four Thirds in general. If you could tell me some of that about that for oh, our yeah. viewers so they don't feel intimidated by, well, I only have a Four Thirds sensor because there's this myth out there that that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, like, so, like, I've, I've always been an Olympus guy, and um, I was using the four-third system right when it came out, and it's funny because I, I dug up one of my, I, I got an astrophotography book for digital astrophotography because I was like, oh, I'll give it a try now that I got a digital camera, and in it, the author said, well, four-third sensors are too small and not sensitive enough for astrophotography, and so I just didn't even bother trying. And then later on, I gave it a try, and I was really blown away. And I was like, okay, there's a false um, persona out there that a smaller sensor is somehow less sensitive. And did some more digging, and, you know, small sensors really are not at a disadvantage in astrophotography. And most of your dedicated astrophotography cameras, um, not only in the past 20 years, but, you know, even today, the majority of astrophotography cameras are smaller sensors. And four-thirds sensors actually feature really heavily in the astrophotography community and we're all tilt up here. So that this red thing up here, this is actually my dedicated astrophotography camera. That's a ZWO 1600. And that uses the four third sensor that is in the EM one Mark one. It's just a model oh. sensor. And so that's probably one of the, it's a really, really popular astrophotography camera. And so, so sensor size, one of the advantages to a four-third sensor, if you're going to get into astrophotography, is that any telescope that you use it with will have an image circle that will support that sensor. Um, there are there are some bigger sensors for dedicated cameras coming out now, and I know ZWO they just came out with a really big thirty, I think it's a sixty megapixel, thirty-five millimeter sensor, and of course I've seen a whole bunch of them up for sale already because guys bought them found out mm -hmm. that their telescope doesn't work with them. And so they're selling them again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that, and that thing about the image circle, you know, if you're going to adapt to a telescope, you know, mm -hmm. telescopes have an image circle and you're saying that that image circle is not really any bigger than a four third sensor anyway. Yeah. Most, most of the time it's, it's not that much bigger. You need a, you need a really big telescope in order to, um, get an image circle that is big enough for those larger sensors yeah. and a bigger telescope means a lot more complications. It makes the hobby a lot harder and a lot more complicated. And that's not the way you want to start. So, right. you know, every, everyone in the astrophotography community will tell you start small. And that's one of the reasons why I started, you know, 
well, I, I continued using four thirds. Actually, my first dedicated camera was like a third inch pixel or a third inch uh, sensor, third of an yeah. inch. Yeah, Tiny. So it's, yeah, really, really small. Yeah. And, uh, and it made starting out really easy. So, okay. You know, um, and so like a lot of these guys who use bigger sensors, like I know APS-C cameras are, uh, the Canons are really popular amongst astrophotography people who are just starting out, but you'll see a huge number of questions online about oh, taking flats. How do I do flats? They're not coming out right. And the reason why they're doing those flats is because a lot of times their telescopes uh, image circle isn't illuminating enough of the sensor. And so they have to do these flats to compensate for the light fall off on the edges of the frame. And mm -hmm. that just, and flats are technically difficult. You know, go, go watch my flats video. You'll see that, you know, there are the largest number of steps involved with setting up for flats of all the different calibration frames you do. And they've got to be just perfect or you'll, you'll get weird artifacts and stuff around the edges of your pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And with, I mean, a, with a four third sensor, you just, you don't have to worry about that that much. Uh, I often like three quarters of the pictures that I take, I don't ever take flats at all. I just keep my equipment clean. I keep dust off of the filters. I keep dust off of the main objective mm -hmm. and I never have problems. Yeah. We, we, and like I said, that's related back to the image circle is just fits it just right. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you had mentioned some other advantages uh, to micro four thirds, I think. Well, it's a squarish format. You know, it's, it's uh -huh. closer to square. And a lot of the objects in space, they fit that format a lot better. Um, I know 35 millimeter is a, more, a little bit more panoramic. And so yeah. a lot of targets don't really quite fit very well in there. So you sometimes you kind of waste pixels, so to speak. Right. And then I, I think you're talking about sensor size doesn't matter in astrophotography. It's about the yes. aperture, right? So if you could explain that. Oh, then. oh yeah. So like it's, it's marking BS is what it is that a larger sensor is more sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And uh, really, the it's the iris diameter is really what matters when it comes to um, how much light you're able to gather. You know, anytime you compare two different sensors with the same field of view, mm -hmm. you know, what really comes down to is the iris size. Mm. And so, for example, you know, we're going to kind of start getting into some math here. So like, let's say if you're shooting with an F4 telescope on a 35 millimeter camera and with a four thirds sensor, you know, you're using the same iris size, it's going to be F2. Um, there's going to be no, no difference whatsoever in the amount of brightness that's on that sensor. Cause you know, brightness as it's illuminated on the image sensor, it's, you know, it's a square millimeter by square millimeter. They're both going to have the same amount of photons of light falling on those pixels. Right, right. And, that, you know, and that's it, a very common myth that larger sensors gather mm -hmm. more light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't. And what what they do is they gather a wider field of view. Yeah, that's it. You know, and anytime you you look through astrophotography dedicated catalogs, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, this bigger sensor has a larger field of view. You know, they won't say, you know, it's brighter, you know, because that's that's a myth. Right. Um, in order to in order to make it brighter, you have to make the pixels larger, and that means you decrease your resolution. So, you know, you're trading something off, essentially. Right, right. Okay, well, let me, uh, let's let's look at a couple of basic images that you took, and you can just give me some basic or, you know, very layman commentary on them uh, to show what's possible with our cameras. Um, so I think... We'll start here. I got I numbered it number one. Hopefully I can do this without Okay. So what are we looking at here, if you can see that? Yes. So that was the very first picture I took with my EM1 Mark I. It's up there on the table or in wow. the fireplace. That's just that's a single 15 second exposure. Wow, just one 15 second exposure. Yeah, so so that was taken using using this telescope here, just the uh -huh. telescope. I didn't have any of these other accessories on there at the time. And I didn't even have the focal reducer at the time. So it's a six hundred millimeter focal length you're looking at. 
shot at f7.5 that's 15 seconds long at iso 1600 and yes it was in the winter time there was snow on the ground i had to shovel the hole <laughs> in the grass at the yeah. observatory and and i was uh, what i was doing that night it was actually a members observing night and we were you know doing mainly visual astronomy and i was like oh it's like i'm gonna go in and warm up i was like I wonder what would happen though if i stuck my camera on there because i had the adopter mm -hmm. and so i did and i took that and i was like whoa that's a lot better than I thought it would be. You know, this, yeah. this is about three, almost four years ago. I took that. Wow! And and just to clarify, this is the EM one Mark one. Yes. With a six hundred millimeter telescope, but that's in thirty five millimeter terms, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, its, it's angle of view is one thousand two hundred millimeters. If you were thinking in the thirty five millimeter world. Right. Right. I yeah, because yeah, you know it it can be confusing. Uh, at least for me, when someone says 600 millimeters, I'm like, well, what, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you Yeah, talking? when I talk telescopes, I just straight out give the numbers. I don't um, yeah. convert it at all. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, you really shouldn't have to convert, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. But that, that's amazing, a, fifth, a single 15-second exposure on EM1 Mark I, and you can get this kind of detail and color and, and resolution. It's pretty amazing. And I'm zoomed in here. Uh, quite a bit. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oops. So the, I'm sorry. Picture two. I I need to find number two. Hold on. There we go. There's number two. Yeah. So this is after I got hooked, so to speak. I discovered, you know, you know, I discovered there that I could take you know, good pictures of this camera, I figured out how to use Deep Sky Stacker, which mm -hmm. there's a link to that in the description of this video. And that's, that's a free piece of software. I found a Mac version of it that's in a wine wrapper online. And I even have a video on my YouTube channel about it. And I took these right here. I think this is almost two, an hour and a half of exposure time total. Mm -hmm. Every single picture you see here is 60 seconds so it's, it's about an hour and a half of 60 second exposures all taken with that telescope on a mount that's just polar lined and tracking the sky uh, almost all telescopes that you buy nowadays that can polar line they, you know, they can track the sky in some way so you know this nothing fancy done here whatsoever i'm just i basically use the intervalometer that's built into all of olympus cameras to just program it to take one picture after another after another after another of this object Mm -hmm. And then I stack them together. And yeah, like I said, this is this is about an hour and a half worth of data. This is taken with the EM1 Mark 1. If we move on to the third picture here. Okay. Hold on. Yes. There we go. Now in this one I got a little bit fancier. So um this is about four hours of data total, you know. And, and, and Astrophotographers, you know, we, we say exposure time, we, we call it collecting data for collecting data. Okay. And uh, so it's four hours total. Some of these pictures, most of them are 60 seconds, but I also took some that were 30 seconds. Okay. And I took some at different ISOs. Some of these were taken at ISO 400, most of them were taken at ISO 1600. And then I stacked all of them together. Also, this is with the light pollution filter from SCT. And then I also had a focal reducer by this point. I had bought one from somebody. And a focal reducer basically shortened the focal length of this telescope from 600 millimeters down to 522. And mm -hmm. it went from F7.5 to F6.3, which is still relatively slow. But uh, it's, it's an improvement nonetheless. And so I was able to capture a lot more detail. And as you can see, like around the outer edges, you can see a lot more of that that hydrogen gas that's out there that's that's not active and so yeah that was that was the best thing i could get with that em1 mark one and and that, yeah. actually there was probably about six hours total and, and i threw out about two hours worth of data mm -hmm. to uh to get you know the best pictures and then stack them together using deep sky stacker and then deep sky stacker exports a a, a tiff file essentially Mm -hmm. um, which is all the stacked data, and then you stretch it in Photoshop to to make it, you know, something that people can see on the screens. Okay. Wow. I mean, that's amazing how much mm -hmm. color you can see, and and uh, again, all the details with just an EM1 Mark One. Mm -hmm. 
And of course you have that terrific telescope to go with it. And I'm gonna ask you a question about that after this next photo here. Mm. Let me see. Uh, uh, picture four? Yeah. Right there, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is with the EM1 Mark III, and this was this was actually the EM1 Mark III that Olympus loaned me to test. And I gotta say, I was just blown away with how much better this sensor is than the original EM1 Mark I. Uh, the this is a 20 megapixel sensor, of course, versus the 16 megapixel Panasonic, and uh, this is only 45 minutes of data. Okay. Wow. Just 45 minutes of data. Again, this is just put on a telescope and allowed to track with the sky. No fancy guiding or anything. Um, guiding broke it on me at that night and I couldn't get it to work again. So I just like, no, oh, we'll just, we'll just shoot. And so I got 45 minutes of this data right here. And what's so incredible about this picture is that not only the color is better, but there was just a lot less noise. And I attribute that to the EM1 Mark III, not only being a better sensor in general, but also it doesn't get as hot. You know, my, the EM1 Mark I, you know, it's the processors in it really heat up quite a bit. And this mm -hmm. guy here, he's, he stays much cooler. And therefore, you know, there's a lot less noise in the picture. Yeah. And it's just, it's really, it's almost, it's about two and a half stops better than the EM1 Mark I's sensor is. Okay. Yeah. In, in and astrophotography. Yes. For astrophotography, yeah. it's about two and a half stops better. And, and if you're doing really long exposures, like let's say you're doing a three minute or five minute exposures, mm -hmm. in that case, well, then you're going to see almost a three stop improvement because with heat based noise, um, your, the noise, skyrockets really quick with longer exposures but because this camera stays cooler you know it has a bigger advantage over the original em1 yeah and it, it's it shows in the picture there's more color and mm -hmm. detail and yeah one, you can see that that dust time. on the outside <laughs> edges is red because you know hydrogen gas is a is a reddish color mm -hmm. you know and and you can still see, and, and the crazy thing is is like in this picture, this is just one set of 60 second exposures. Okay. I didn't do any bracketing, so to speak. Mm. And so even in the very core of the nebula, there's still lots and lots of detail, even though the core of Orion is an extremely bright area, a really bright part of the sky. Even, yeah. even in the city, I can see this with my naked eye. Wow. So. wow. I'm, just, I'm just amazed. You know, you can see that the the, the subtle differences in color and everything. And I'm, I hope this is coming out on the stream okay. Uh, now, that said, I'm going to ask you a quick question before we go mm -hmm. into some of the basics of getting started. Um, because you're using a telescope, 600 millimeters, and you're talking about apertures of, uh, well, 500 millimeters, right, with the focal reducer, 522, and apertures of like 7, F7. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it brings to mind a question that Peter from the chat is asking, you know, can you use like a like the Olympus 100 to 400 or a 300 millimeter lens with a 2x teleconverter? You'll be at like closer to f8. Yeah, Peter, I think, well, Peter's asking 300 millimeter f2.8 with a 2x teleconverter, which I think would be f5.6, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not aware of a 300 millimeter f2.8. I think it's an f4. Uh, the old Olympus four thirds lens was a 300 millimeter 2.8. Wow. Okay. So that's, and that's, that's a time. lens I would love to acquire someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you could totally do this with that lens and you would actually have a little bit of an advantage over my telescope because that lens would be an F 5.6, whereas uh, my telescope is an F 6.3. So, uh, for example, this picture right here taken with the EM1 Mark three, if you were also using an EM1 Mark three, you could probably do this picture in about half an hour versus me doing it in 45 minutes because you have uh, almost a half stop advantage. Wow. Okay. I appreciate that because, you know, we, you're using a telescope, but we can, we can just use the Olympus and Olympus lens, assuming it's good quality. And we'll talk about mm -hmm. that later uh, about yeah. some lens choices, but um, let's, um, let me hide this and, you know, I, I just wanted to show those images early to give people a feel for what is definitely possible with micro four thirds, mm -hmm. you know, despite all of the misinformation out there, I think, um, 
I am, misinformation is kind of a strong word. I would just say misunderstanding of. Well, they're not telling the whole story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about some of the basics of astrophotography mm -hmm. with respect to, you know, uh, doing simple images like the single shot 15 second ones up to uh, maybe doing stacking and things. And then some of the vocabulary that you may be using and when we mm -hmm. go to the more advanced topics so that uh, people can follow along, you know, best, best so I can follow along too. So, um, all right. Um, yeah. So let's, let's talk the, the 300 rule. So this, this is an EM one. This is my E1 Mark II with the 25 millimeter f1.2 lens on it. So uh, typically, the 300 rule is you take the focal length, which is in millimeters, okay, and this is in the this is for 35 millimeter, the 35 millimeter world. So this is a 25 millimeter lens here on a four thirds camera, but you would want to treat it like it was a 50 millimeter lens because you know the 300 rule is is for 35 millimeter. So anyways, you would take in this case. 300 and you would divide it by 50 and that would give you a number and that number is going to be the number of seconds that you can expose for without getting star trails. So if you want to get started really basic and you know when I was in Hawaii you know we were on a beautiful sky I had a fisheye lens with me I didn't have a tracker or anything and but I still wanted to get a picture of the sky all I did was I set the camera up with the self timer to take a bunch of pictures and I just laid the camera on the table like this and I let it take pictures of the sky and using the 300 rule to basically calculate how long of an exposure I could take before I started seeing star trails. So that right there is, is one of the, uh, the number one things that, you know, if you just want to experiment absolute basics, um, you know, leave the noise compression on and all that kind of stuff in the, uh, the settings in the camera and, you know, just take a picture that you can see really quickly, you know, just do the 300 rule. And, uh, and then you can get, you can get some pictures of the constellations and you probably be able to even, if you're in a dark enough place, you know, you'll see, uh, some nebulosity, you know, you'll be really surprised. So you want to bump up the ISO, um, typically 1600 or even higher. A lot of guys use 3200 and, uh, you'd also want to open the aperture all the way. Now I personally don't open the aperture all the way, but that's, you know, deeper stuff we can go into later because of the optics. And then once you get into the star tracker stuff which is you know this guy right here I get it in camera um then you can start taking much longer exposures but again i'm sorry and then oh yeah this right here is a skyview pro um adventurer and it has the ability to track the sky you you, you mount your camera on here and there's actually a, a polar scope on the inside axis of this thing, which uh, allows it to like basically rotate with the sky at the rate at which the sky moves. And that'll, that'll allow you to basically lengthen your exposures by a significant amount. You know, you, you won't have to really use the 300 rule. You can start using the 1000 rules. I like to call it or the 2000 rule. Um, and okay. then, okay. and then you can, uh, of course, the longer the focal length is the more sensitive it's going to be to any kind of errors in the guiding or in or the movement to the sky, you know. So if you're using a 300 millimeter lens, well, then you're going to be using a half second exposure in order to not get any star trails. Yeah, right, right. And then and let's talk about the darkness of skies, you know. So so most photographers, you know, we use Bortle class as a uh, as a measurement of how much light pollution there is in the sky. You know, that's uh, that's wasted photons of light that go up and uh, increase our carbon footprint on this planet. But anyways. Uh, the Bortle class system is it's from 10 to 0. 0 would be absolutely perfect. That would be like Hubble up in space or on top of a really tall mountain, you know, 20,000 feet or more. And mm -hmm. then uh, 10 would be, you know, New York City where, you know, even the moon has to fight against light pollution in order to be seen. And I typically, I live in a Bortle 6 area in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And the observatory that I go to is about a Bortle 5. It's a, it's a low Bortle 5. And then I have a couple dark sky places that are in this area. They're like little parks and, and hunting areas around here. And they allowed me to get down to just into a Bortle 4, really a Bortle 4.8 class sky. And the important thing to know about, about light pollution is that when you're shooting without filtration and, you know, when you're shooting 
against that light pollution, that light pollution is in essence a type of noise. So if you, if you worry about noise, then drive to a dark sky spot. And because uh, mm -hmm. every every time every magnet every level of magnitude that that uh, sky gets darker you know it, it decreases that light pollution noise so to speak by considerable amounts every i'm sorry repeat that for me one more time uh, so so when you're when you're shooting from a dark sky mm -hmm. um the light pollution noise so to speak you know because light pollution is a type of noise in astrophotography um, that decreases by considerable amounts when you go to a darker sky. And then that's why it's, for so many people, it's worth it for them to travel to a location to, uh, you know, to get to a darker sky. Yeah. yeah. It, it means that it takes less exposure time, essentially, in order to get the same image. Right, right. And that, and that leads me to another question is, you know, what about these light pollution filters that they have available? Mm -hmm. And I've seen the ones that clip directly over your sensor. And then I guess they have some screw on types. Oh, uh, yes, I have there. So here I actually have with me. This is from this is from STC. This is a light pollution filter, which was rather expensive and it clips into your camera. Mm -hmm. window you can use basically any olympus lens with this it's got some dust on it but uh but this guy here it's a multi-spectral filter so it doesn't it doesn't quite block all light but it will turn your image green and what it does is it only allows through uh the specific wavelengths that most nebula and astronomy objects are made out of okay mm. so most things that are in space if you look at the rainbow, okay, they emit very specific slivers of light along the rainbow, okay? So the majority of light that's out there comes from here on Earth. Whereas these emission nebulas, like they they transmit sometimes, okay, like the, the visual spectrum, I think is between 300 nanometers and seven or 800 nanometers. And like hydrogen, the hydrogen spectrum is one and a half nanometers wide. So all the rest of that makes up all the other light that we see, whereas hydrogen, that hydrogen spike that's only one and a half nanometers wide on the, the spectrum of light, it actually makes up about 90% of what is in space. And so if you block all of the rest of that out and you, and you use just that tiny little sliver, um, you basically reduce light pollution by significant amounts, uh, sometimes almost 100, you know, almost a factor of 100. And actually, the, the light pollution filters that I use, the narrowband filters, as we call them, um, they've reduced light pollution in, in my backyard by almost a factor of 100, which is great because, you know, I can do it from my backyard and it makes processing it very easy. Now, yeah, another... I was going to say, hence the name of your channel. <laughs> yes, the narrowband channel, you know. Right, um, right. This is something that a guy on the Olympus OMD astrophotography group on Facebook posted a link to that we could all download. It's a 3D printed little clip. And what you will need to do, I'd like to ask him to modify this a little bit so that you can use an actual filter, but uh, you can take a standard and these are very cheap. You know, you can get one and a quarter inch filters and you can actually remove the glass piece that's in there and actually, I have, if I can get it off here, I actually have one of these clips. I know I'm wearing black, so you black on black here. But I can, that little filter basically slides into this, and then this thing would go into the camera. And actually, let's do that. Let's stick it. These types of filters are very popular for people who are just starting out, and they just want to use... Um, they just want to use their SLR. So yeah, you take this guy and you stick it right in there like that. And that will actually hold a piece of glass in there. And you could use, you know, a regular one and a quarter inch filter. And I haven't actually tested this thing out yet myself, but you know, I can actually get one of these guys to kind of screw in, so to speak, so that it's in there. And with a telescope, this should, this should work fine. Obviously an Olympus micro four thirds lens is going to have issues with this because, you know, there's elements that are going to get in the way here. But um, this is kind of a, a fun way that you can use a lot of these broadband multi-spectral light pollution filters to kind of get rid of 
some of that light pollution. Now, now these broadband light pollution filters, they are not as effective as they used to be. They used to be very, very effective at removing light pollution. But because everybody's using LED lights now, um, they're not quite as effective because LED lights emit light across the entire spectrum, whereas the old sodium halogen lights they emitted light across a very specific sodium. It's like a yellowish type light. And that was really easy to filter out. That's why it used to be when you went out at night, you know, the sky looked kind of yellowish, you know, from that light pollution. Now it, now it's kind of a cool bluish white yeah. because, you know, the LED lights are across the entire spectrum and you, and you right. can't filter them out quite as well as you used to. Yeah. And a lot of car headlights now are <laughs> yes LEDs and so that's interesting. So the filters aren't playing. I mean, do you think they so help, not, but not, not mandatory anymore so much, right? Yeah. yeah, they're not as mandatory anymore. And a lot of people do shoot without any filtration whatsoever. You know, it's it's kind of a fun thing that, to get, though, and like try in the city. You know, I, I did it for about two years. I use light pollution filters, mm -hmm. but now I shoot almost completely um, narrow band. And then if I'm going to use my my olympus gear i go to a darker sky spot like the observatory or i go out to even a, a darker spot than that like something like yeah. portal four and and using a filter i mean just a couple quick question one mm -hmm. is you know when you're using a filter do you lose any light i mean for the astro do you have to use longer exposures or okay so what a filter allows you to do is take a longer exposure if that makes sense so, okay. so normally in the city, like here in the city with my Newtonian, my F5 Newtonian, if I tried, I tried recently to take pictures with it, I could only take 10 second exposures before the picture was almost white. Mm -hmm. Okay. From all the light pollution. Uh, but if I put that light pollution filter on there, well, then I can take almost a one minute exposure and it mm. doesn't really block the stuff that's coming from space but it blocks most of the light pollution and so the image doesn't get overexposed as quickly and so then i can take a longer exposure does that make sense yes that makes perfect sense yeah and mm. and because all this stuff in space is faint okay really really faint you need those long exposures you know the longer the exposure you can take the better um, right. And with the narrow band stuff that I do, those those filters are so narrow and they eliminate so much of the light pollution that I can sometimes take 20 minute exposures and which is just mind blowing like that, wow. that long of an exposure. And it soaks up a ton of detail, of really, really faint things, you know, that, you know, are, are completely invisible to our eyes, even with gigantic telescopes, you can't see them with, with, a, wow. with your eye. So that, okay, so this brings up a whole nother range of questions, and I, I want to address one or two from the chat section as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there, there's also screw-on type filters. Are they yes. effective as well? Yeah, and uh, actually a really good one that I have one of these. It's a batter um, moon and sky glow filter. I think it's around 100 bucks, mm -hmm. and that is actually the one that I, I intend to use with that little plastic 3D printed clip. Mm. And... Uh, and I'm going to try and try that one here soon. I was actually going to try and do it before we got to this video, but it's been almost four or five weeks here since I've had a clear night Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. of the winter and everything. So I really haven't been able to get out there much. Um, last night was clear, but you know, I did narrow band last night. Okay. So, all right. And then, but yeah, yeah. The batter, the, the SCT, that's, it's a little expensive. I think it's almost 200 bucks. Um, they also make a dual, uh, band filter, they call it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's actually a really good filter. I would like to get one eventually, but I think in order to really use that filter, well, I think you need a, a, a modified camera and a modified mm -hmm. camera is where they remove the UV IR cut filter in a mm -hmm. camera because the UV IR cut filters in most daytime cameras, unfortunately they reduce hydrogen which hydrogen is extremely important in astrophotography because 90 percent of the stuff in space is hydrogen you know right. that, that just really it increases the, the length of exposures you need in order to get any detail at all right and, and, that, and that, that brings up a question from the mm -hmm. chat about you know ir conversion cameras or maybe full spectrum cameras that have been converted 
Yeah, there's a lot of guys on the OMD astrophotography group on Facebook who are using these modified cameras. And I got to say, they get some great results with them. Um, mm -hmm. I would get one modified, but, you know, it, it's kind of <laughs> like, oh, the only one that I would want to modify would be an EM1 Mark III. And I only have one and I can't afford to get another one yet. <laughs> right, right. And... And when and I, start, I almost need three cameras, really, you know, and all of them need to be EM1 Mark threes, you know, and yeah. one of them would be modified and then the other two would be normal because I need one for video. I need one for regular uh, astrophotography or photography in general. And then yeah. I need one that's just dedicated to photog astrophotography. Well, let me ask you then. There's the EM1 Mark II, I believe, has the same exact sensor. Is that okay, it does. Mm -hmm. But remember, if you remember, if you watch my review it has a bit of a disadvantage because it's it's processor produces a lot more heat and therefore it produces a lot more noise, you know, with those really long exposures. Okay. Um, for daytime photography, you will see no difference whatsoever in the noise between the two. Right. But in astrophotography, it really pushes the camera to its limits and you start yes. to see those sort of defects. Yeah. No, actually, call, them, call them defects, but you know, you you hit those those limitations you wouldn't normally hit in any other kind of photography. Yeah, and this right here is my this is my heat gun, so to speak. It's basically a laser pointer, mm -hmm. um, thermal gun that this is what I use to measure the temperature of the backs of my cameras. Now I know Olympus does have heat sensors in these cameras that do record that data, but I have for the life of me not been able to find a piece of software yet that allows me to read that information off the file, the off the EXIF data. Mm. If anyone knows of one that works on the Mac, you know, let me know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, if anyone knows some some exit and, data reader that can pull that information. And I and I've I've emailed Olympus about this a couple of times. I like, was like, please, please allow us to in Olympus Viewer sort the pictures by temperature. Yeah. Because if I could do that, then I could match my dark frames with the temperature that was taken while I was doing my light frames of the actual stars. And right. that would allow me to subtract that dark thermal noise um, a lot better than I can right now. Cause right now I'm just using that, that heat gun and I'm writing it down on my phone. It's like, well, I took it at this time, it was this temperature. And then I come back 15 minutes later and I write down the temperature again. I come back 15 minutes later, I write down the temperature again. And then, Usually what I have is I have a, a library of darks that I've taken. Uh, usually I just put the camera in the, the shed and I mm -hmm. come out there. I record the temperature once in a while while it takes these dark pictures. And I have a library full of folders of all these different temperatures. And I just take um, a dark folder that's that temperature and I use that to calibrate and subtract off of um, my light frames. And the, the beauty of that, you know, if you've seen my, my calibration frame series, um, astrophotographers, we are really, really good at dealing with noise. And by using many pictures to remove that dark thermal noise, um, mm -hmm. we can really decrease the amount of noise by considerable amounts. Uh, sometimes we gain four or even five stops of noise reduction in doing this. Okay. Whereas so, I, I know Olympus has a, it's a, it's a dark current like type subtraction uh, setting in the camera, which I tell you to turn off if you're using calibration frames. And what that does is it just subtracts one frame. But if you stack a whole bunch of frames and then subtract those, you get a much, much better thermal noise reduction. Right. In, in. Okay. So before we move a little further, let's back up because mm -hmm. we went from putting your camera on a picnic table facing oh. straight up <laughs> with multiple frames. So I, I want to, I want you to explain a little bit about doing going, instead of doing a single image, you're talking about taking multiple images. And this, this is a question I think a lot of people have that I'm going to pop up. Uh, just explain that process. And it, it doesn't matter what camera and lens you're using, but this process of taking multiple exposures, then bringing them in. And then, yeah. So yeah. Let me get out my camera. So we're on the M1 Mark One right now. So you go into menu and then you go to the camera number two setting and then all the way, oh, I'm sorry, camera number one setting. And then all the way at the bottom here, there's a multi frame time exposure. And it's not on right now because I am in, why is it not on? It's because I'm in video mode. Let's go to manual. Yeah, so you need to have the camera in either manual 
in manual mode. And then you can come down here to camera one and then go into, this is the interval time-lapse setting, all right? And in the interval time-lapse setting, you have the ability, I've actually already got this thing set up to take 200 frames, there's a start time delay of one second on it, okay? Let's see if, and then interval length is basically gonna be, the exposure time is just gonna be whatever I set the exposure time to be up in the main menu. Which, so right now, so we could bring exposure right down here to 60 seconds. So I'll do it once again here. So we're in the main menu, camera number one, go all the way to the bottom. And you gotta turn this thing on every single time you do it. Interval time lapse, you have to turn it on, and then you select the number of frames, what kind of delay you want in between each one, what, what kind of delay start you want. And we don't want a time lapse movie, and the movie settings don't really matter. But once you turn that on, then you can hit menu, hit OK, and then get out of it. And up here at the top, you'll see a little clock with a square around it with like a number on it. Right now it says 200. And that's going to be how many uh, frames this, this camera will take. Once I hit the shutter button the first time, it'll just start taking one picture after another, after another, after another. And, and this is one of the things I love about my Olympus cameras is that that is built into the camera. Um, I wish we weren't limited to, to a 60 second exposure. I wish I could do longer exposures. And yeah. I asked Olympus about this a couple of times, but we'll see if they, they lengthen it longer. Right. In the and, and, you know, do, do you have a tutorial on this on your channel about the settings for that? Or I don't know if I've ever actually done that. Okay. Because I, I have a time ones. lapse video mm -hmm. or tutorial on time lapse that goes into the line by line detail about how to set up the intervalometer. Mm -hmm. But they would apply it. Uh, for astrophotography, they would need to use different settings, obviously. But if you guys want to are not familiar with how to use the intervalometer, I do have a video called Time Lap, and that'll show you how to use it. And then you can you can ask Ben, you know, what settings work best as you get more advanced into your astrophotography. Uh, so so you set up sixty seconds, and then there's mm -hmm. a time between shots. Do you need to set up a specific time between each shot? So in the winter time, I do one second. Okay. In the summertime, I do 10 to 20, okay. and it, that's because in the summertime, it's hot, okay, mm -hmm. and the camera needs a little bit of time to cool down between each picture, uh, and if you're using a larger sensor, this is the thing about larger sensors, um, larger sensors produce more heat, you know, mm -hmm. um, so with a larger sensor, you're going to need to let it cool down even longer. Like mm. I, I tell people in my astrophotography class, I teach an astrophotography class at our observatory, which is on hold because of COVID. But uh, if you've got a 35 more sensor, I say, you know, give it 30 seconds between shots. If yeah. it's hot, you know, because yeah, it, it needs that time to cool down because thermal noise is just... It's 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 astronomical in astrophotography. <laughs> yeah, and you were you were telling me that the noise doubles every Celsius, right? Over yeah. So when when you get to twenty degrees Celsius, I mean it's it's on a it's on a curve. It's the logarithmic curve is how mm -hmm. thermal noise works. But uh, when you get to twenty degrees Celsius, every single degree Celsius that it goes up from there, it doubles. Yeah. You know, so right. if you're at twenty two degrees Celsius, you're gonna have four times as well, two times as much noise as is at 20 degrees and you know if you're at 25 degrees celsius you know you can have mm -hmm. about five times as much noise as you would at 20 degrees celsius and mm -hmm. that's why a lot of these dedicated astrophotography cameras um like the the zwo that i pointed to up earlier that red thing it has a built-in refrigerator essentially that cools the sensor and uh if you take a camera sensor from 30 degrees celsius to zero degrees celsius you will see a 97 percent drop in thermal noise okay wow and, and actually we should we should talk about this real quick so like there mm -hmm. are different types of noise and there are different things that cause different types of noise and the best way to get rid of noise is to deal with each component of noise individually all right that's mm -hmm. why we do all these calibration frames you know i know uh what's this new software that everybody's yelling about right now that that reduces noise um oh uh, denoise, AI denoise, uh, yeah, topaz, it, topaz, topaz. There we go. You know, the yeah. problem with topaz is that it's just using an algorithm that tries to preserve details while smoothing the image. 
okay? Whereas calibration frames, we are actually figuring out, okay, this pixel is overreacting by this amount because of these conditions. And so we remove that overreaction or underreaction, we compensate for it, and that is a better way of reducing noise. And you can, you can just get rid of an enormous amount of noise this way. Okay. Let me ask so, you this. So mm -hmm. this is, and I'm, like I said, I, I'm learning <laughs> with our viewers. So let's say we set up an intervalometer. We take our, let's say, 60 second exposures, and we do that for 45 minutes, right? So we have 45 exposures. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we most often tell you is when you're first starting out, Mm -hmm. is as soon as you get done with your lights, you know, that, that's those 45 pictures that you just took, mm -hmm. um, put a lens cap on the camera and then take 45 or so darks. Right? Okay, or, so the lights are just the normal 60-second exposures and then yep. the darks. because the exact are... same exposure time but uh -huh. with the lens cap on. And what that does is that allows us to create an image that has just the thermal noise that the sensor is producing without oh. it capturing the light. Okay. So we have our lights and we have our dark. So now we're up to about an hour and a half, right? Yeah. See, this, this is why I do calibration frames on a set at a separate time because, uh -huh. you know, it can, it can get into your astrophotography. Now I'll tell you this, when I, when I go to locations and stuff, you know, I'm mm -hmm. out and my wife wants me back by midnight. Um, what I will often do is I'll take my lights. Okay. And then I throw the lens cap on the camera and I put it in the back of the car and I do not turn the heat on in the car. Okay. Mm. Sometimes I even crack the windows down and yeah, I know it's 20 degrees in the car, but I drive home while the camera is taking darks. Oh, okay. interesting. <laughs> so that way, <laughs> yeah, that way I get darks, um, that are, you know, about the same temperature as when I was taking my lights. And right. then when I do my stacking, you know, I can, I can subtract those. And then another type of calibration frame that we do is called bias frames. In mm -hmm. a bias frame, you just want to use the absolute fastest shutter speed that your camera can use, which on these is a 32 thousandth of a second. And uh, you, you take, I usually take about 200 bias frames because they're really easy to do and you can do them at any time. You can, you can do them in your living room. You know, you just set up your intervalometer for, you know, a 32nd thousandth of a second exposure and do mm -hmm. 200 of them. And I just click the shutter button, let, let things sit on the couch and do its thing for, mm -hmm. you know. And what, what is the purpose minutes. of a bias frame? So a bias frame is another type of noise that is on the sensor and it's not dependent upon temperature. Mm. Okay. It's at the very bottom of the noise floor. And mm -hmm. it's, it's based, a lot of people call it read noise or shot noise. Um, I don't like the term shot noise because I don't think it really describes it very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, bias noise, it's the, it's the smallest form of noise in your sensor. But when you're taking these pictures and really stretching them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it becomes apparent, you know, because we're, we're really, really, really stretching these pictures a long ways. And so, so that bias frame allows us to remove all that bias noise from the bottom. And actually your software, that's, that's the first thing it does is when you, when you, because the way you process stuff, if you watched my Deep Sky Stacker video, you know, first you tell it where your light frames are, and then you tell it where your dark frames are, and then you tell it where your your bias frames are, and then your flat frames and so forth. And then, and what it's doing is it's, it takes your image and it stacks all of them together, okay, mm -hmm. and creates a master, and then it takes all your bias frames, stacks them all together, averages them all together, and gets an absolute average same thing with your darks, same thing with your flats, takes them all, stacks them all together, it creates mm -hmm. like four images, okay? Okay. And then it takes your master image and it subtracts the uh, the dark thermal noise and then it subtracts the bias noise and then it subtracts or adds to whatever it needs to for the flats. Okay. And that gives you, that gives each pixel as near to the truest possible value of what is actually detected as far as light goes. Okay, and, that, and that's another one you you need to explain is what is a mm -hmm. flat okay yeah, yeah so flats uh flats are what you'll you'll see you'll see a lot of guys using APS-C or 35 mode sensors screaming about flats and that's because flats basically compensate for vignetting from the camera mm -hmm. okay? okay and also if there are dust motes little specks of dust on your filters or on the lens of the telescope or on your mirrors mm -hmm. um, those can show up as little dark spots in your picture and 
this is one of the great things about being an Olympus guy is that because of the noise reduction and removal system on our sensors, I don't really ever have to worry as much about flats. And I actually do about, you know, three quarters of my astrophotography without any flats whatsoever. Wow. Because I'm using a small enough sensor that it's it's completely within the image circle of my telescope mm -hmm. and, and most of my lenses. And so, yeah, flats, flats I don't do very often. They're the most complicated to set up and do. Uh, mm -hmm. You should go watch my flats video. Okay. And, uh, but there, there are actually, there, there is a very small component of noise that is taken care of by a flat. But in order for that flat to do that, you need to take what combination with it, what's called a dark flat. And, and that, that's getting kind of a little deep. Yeah. So, okay. Well, but they flats go to your are, channel for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Flat, flats are mainly to get rid of the vignetting mm -hmm. or to compensate for any dirt that's on your sensor. Okay? okay. And Olympus guys, we really don't have to worry about that that much. So that's physical type noise, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly, it's like, it's obstruction type noise. So to right. speak. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, that brings me to answering the last part of this question is you're using the software, free software, Deep Sky Stacker mm -hmm. to merge all of the frames together and subtract frames out, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a whole tutorial on that on your channel. Yeah. I think when I did that, I was doing it with narrowband stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, because the, nar the narrowband picture is they stack a lot faster because they're cleaner. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. But the, I think the concept's the same. And Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same, really. So you should be able to follow along if you get Deep Sky Stacker, the concepts when you're doing it with the narrowband software. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So definitely, you guys, um, that was a lot of information. I know, at least for me. <laughs> I could talk a long time about yeah. this. I mean, and, uh, you know, but the idea being is, yeah, we can do the single shot, 15 second exposures on a picnic table, or we can get a tracker, set up the intervalometer, take, you know, 45 to 50, you know, a light, take 45, 50 darks, mm -hmm. and then do the bias frames on our sofa. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And then do the flats aren't, aren't quite as necessary. Uh, you, you know, do that, learn to do that last, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> And and there's also there's also live bulb feature on mm -hmm. Olympus cameras. You know that's a great way if you know if you don't want to mess with the calibration frames. You know just start off with that. You know get get yourself hungry. A lot of astrophotographers their start was holding their cell phone up to the eyepiece of their telescope. You know that's how they started. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I I've done that, but I did not start that way. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but I know like two, two of the other guys, actually the one other guy who helps me teach the astrophotography class at Naylor, uh, he got his start that way. He held his iPhone 3G, I think it was up to his little four and a half inch refractor and was taking pictures of the moon that way. And I think maybe even Orion or something. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't been able to stop since and neither have I. So, oh. so explain to me, you know, why you would use like live bulb, live time versus, I guess the live bulb, live time is more just for single long exposures, right? Yeah, live bulb is excellent for star trails. Ah, you know, it's okay. it's so easy for star trails. You know, any of the other camera manufacturers out there, you gotta you get you need to use an intervalometer to take one picture after another, and you gotta make sure the gaps between each picture are short, so that you know you don't get dots of stars going across the sky, and then mm -hmm. you gotta stack it together on software. Whereas Olympus cameras, you know, it's just Use live bulb, you know, set it on a tripod, let the sky do its thing. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> okay. uh, and it's funny because, you know, you, you get on the Canon, Nikon, Sony, whatever forms, you won't see very many star trail photos. Get on the Olympus ones, I see mm -hmm. them all the time, you know. Yeah. And it's yeah. because it's really easy to do with an Olympus camera. Uh, yeah. I don't know about Panasonic. I yeah. never owned a Panasonic, so. <laughs> If somebody wants to try, one of my viewers, if you have a Panasonic, let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, go to a uh, narrowband channel and let him know because he he would appreciate that a lot more than I would. Um, and then uh, let me just back up a little bit about. Let's see. So Did when you want to talk about that so right? the uh, website that I use to find like dark sky spots. 
Okay, well, we'll get to that next. But I, okay. you know, just to back up, we're doing these these multiple exposures: forty-five, fifty exposures, sixty exposures. Um, you're going to need to use a tracker. You can't just do that handheld or on a tripod, yeah. right? Uh, so talk about trackers. Maybe answer this question best you can. That the up. 300 millimeter lens. Yeah. I mean, he's he's asking about the accuracy of these trackers and all of that. That's I'm not familiar with that kind of gear. <laughs> Every single tracker, even if it's the exact same model, is going to be a little different. Okay. So mm. as to how long of an exposure you can take before you start seeing star trails or maybe jittering or whatnot in the gears of these things, you got to try it for yourself. Um, I know with this guy here, with a 200 millimeter lens, I can typically get away with a 30 second exposure. And recently, let's see, with a 75 millimeter lens, I can almost get away with a three minute exposure with this guy. Okay. So obviously a shorter focal length is going to be much more forgiving. Now, the great thing about buying one of these things mm -hmm. is you can start out with a very basic kit. I think that I think it comes just like just just this part up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just just this. And I think these start out around 200 and there's even more basic ones than this. But the great thing about the Skywatcher Adventure is that you can start out with a basic one and then you can add to it, add to it. Like obviously, like I bought this guy right here. And what this allows me to do is tilt the head to, uh, to align it with the North Pole. And if you didn't want to buy this, you know, most of your tripods will actually allow you to kind of tilt the tripod or maybe space the legs differently so that you could get this thing uh, lined up with the North Pole. And then there is the, this is the polar finder there's actually a reticle in here and you would line this up with the north pole and you want to get that as, as precise as you can and that'll help you with uh getting longer exposures once again mm -hmm. and then i mean you saw it earlier i had the uh this guy right here this will allow you to add a heavier camera to this thing um if you were not going to use this if you were just going to start out with this kit right here I would recommend nothing more than a 45 millimeter, maybe the 75 millimeter lens. Okay. And I wouldn't use a battery grip just because of the weight. And, mm. but then once you, uh, once you get one of these right here and, and, and I love this little thing, this thing's pretty, pretty slick. The newer ones are even Wi-Fi. Like there's an app that comes with it and you can program this thing. Uh, to do a create this crazy thing called dithering, which we could we could get into later, but it's it's for more advanced people, and it's another way to get rid of more noise, and and you can program it to do you know a bunch of cool different things as it tracks. So and then of course you know you've got the because you you would set the camera up here on here and then you would want to release the clutch and then get the thing to balance first. Mm -hmm. Um, which plenty of people have videos out there on how to do that with these. Um, there's actually a host of videos on this particular uh, tracker. You know, there's, there's probably more videos about this tracker than any of the other ones. So okay. that's probably one of the reasons why I haven't done one myself. It's just because there are so many videos out there already. Right, right. And, did, and what's the name of that tracker one more time? Very right, clearly. So this is the Skywatcher Adventurer Pro. Okay. So I'll just type it in Skywatcher. Adventurer Pro. And you can get just the Skywatcher Adventurer, okay, without the Pro. Mm -hmm. The Pro just adds uh, this counterweight and then this, this part right here. Okay. So we have, we need a very sturdy tripod, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Buy an old used one, you know, get a heavy one, you know, because like uh, uh, you can go to a used camera store. I know I bought this guy here for about 60 bucks at a camera store used. You know, the old heavy ones are good because the wind won't blow them over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, heavy, you know, good heavy tripod, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a tracker. And then there's plenty of tutorials online about the tracker, this particular tracker. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and again, like I said, Ben's channel has a lot of, lot of amazing videos on there about uh, doing astrophotography with 
trackers and software. So I think one of my earliest videos, maybe my second video, I think it was, uh, was, was showing that guy off basically just the setup that I mm -hmm. use. And that was actually, I had on there, I think it was an EM one Mark one and the old Olympus 50 to 200 F 2.8 F 3.5. Yes. Yes. I saw yeah. that one. Um, so let me just recap just slightly, just a little bit of best I can mm -hmm. is, um, you're taking multiple exposures, lights, darks, bias, and flats. flats. Yeah. Okay. Flats are not quite as critical on our Olympus cameras, but yeah, they're not learn that critical. last because you said that's difficult. Yeah. And then uh, you need a tracker, and then you need to use that software, Deep Sky Stacker. Mm -hmm. Which and, is free. Yeah. And you have a lot of this information on your channel. So if you have any questions about that whole process to get the kind of images that we saw. And let's go look at the images. Uh, definitely go to his channel about that. Don't ask me. <laughs> um, so we talked about Deep Sky Stacker. And that's that's kind of the process, the end process. But, you know, astrophotography takes a lot of planning as well, right? Um, if you're going to go to a dark sky spot, definitely test everything that you do in your backyard first i don't doesn't matter how light polluted your backyard is mm -hmm. just make sure you can get sharp stars with your setup you know in your backyard first then go to a dark sky location you don't want to go to a dark sky location and experiment there don't do it i've done it on accident <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll say on accident because i have too much pride to say that i've done it on purpose um but yeah it, you, you don't want to experiment at a dark sky location right. you know only, only use tried and true techniques because time at a dark sky location when there's good weather is precious mm -hmm. you, and then when you're when you're when you're fairly confident that you've learned all you can in your backyard You've you mentioned a couple of apps that I put links down below. Mm -hmm. that, are they weather apps and and light pollution maps? But explain those to me. Yeah. So okay. So I use. Let me bring them up here. On my phone. So I use an app called Clear Outside. Okay, that's the main one that I use to check to see uh, whether or not it's going to be a good night for me to even mm -hmm. peek my head outside and see if it's good enough to set up. Uh, and then obviously you if you want to go to a dark sky location you need two things you need good weather okay which these apps can provide you with and you also typically need a new moon or at least there needs to be you know at least a quarter of a moon or less because if the moon's full the moon provides a form of light pollution even at a dark sky location you wouldn't want to go to a dark sky location and it's a full moon right um now a lot of times i can get away with a half moon because the target that i'm shooting is up the first half of the night and the moon doesn't come up until the second half of the night and so that's kind of one way that you can work around the moon um and and i love getting up early in the morning you know i have no problem waking up at one o'clock and i've actually got my best photos that way um yeah that last picture that we looked at of orion was uh -huh. taken at one o'clock in the morning or well i got up at one o'clock in the morning to go take that and yeah I, this one no 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 not the yeah is that yes that's the last one yeah picture four right yes yes yeah um that one i did in the morning and also by the way mornings are actually the the time of night where light pollution is the lowest like anytime one o'clock and beyond mm -hmm. um, most people who are going to turn off their lights have turned them off by one o'clock and so that's that's kind of the, the i call it the golden hour for astrophotography is the mornings also the sky is the steadiest and, and then one more app that i use and i use this a lot for planning it's called astrospheric and mm -hmm. that is also going to be down in the description and a great thing about astrospheric is if you scroll down at the bottom there's actually a map there you can go and you can look there's blue dots all over the usa where people have uh talked to you know have have look, put a pin for a location of all mm. these dark sky spots that you can go to and they're all public i'm pretty sure all of those blue dots are publicly accessible dark sky locations that you know if if you feel uncomfortable you know going to a location you know that you don't know mm -hmm. has been checked out you know those that's a great way to look for a dark sky location and that app also provides you with weather information as well okay wow so 
a lot of the work's been done for us in terms of finding spots with one yes. of these apps. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, there's a great network out there. I know actually more than half of the locations on Astrofaric that are in the Pennsylvania area are locations that I have added to that app. Oh, wow. So, okay. And, <laughs> so you know, Ben kind of is only a couple hours from me, so we might get together yeah. one time and do a live stream live, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, on, on location maybe one day. But uh, and, and speaking of, you know, we're in the northern hemisphere. Uh, there's a question here. It says, in the southern hemisphere, do you align with a southern cross star or – is is how is it they different? don't have a pole star like we do that's really bright um mm -hmm. i know on this on the star adventure here there is actually instructions with the app that comes with it on how to do it i mean i don't live in the southern hemisphere okay. i kind of wish i did though even though they don't have a north star because i'll tell you what some of those beautiful things in the sky are in the southern hemisphere um, the Carina Nebula is down there. Really? And so you that, can see things you wouldn't see here. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of things in the southern hemisphere that are really fantastic looking. In the north, we have Andromeda. That that's our that's our thump our chest and say you guys don't have Andromeda. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, let's look at a couple images. Um, and actually, let's take a let's take a one minute break here for everybody because it's been about a little over an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, come back because uh, my dog was just going crazy too. So I need to see what's going on. But we we should take a one minute break, come back, and then we'll look at a few more images where you can talk. Of, you know, so everybody can digest everything you just talked about. But then we can talk about these next images in a little more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll just go to a Q and A from there. So let everyone let's just take a one minute break and. Uh, We'll be right back. All right. Okay, we're back. I just had to check because, as you guys know, if you're my normal, regular viewers, I have a lot of, my mom calls all the time, and she just comes over with soup, and that's why I thought maybe my dog was barking, so I had to check that. Plus, I thought a little one-minute break because we talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, so what I want to do is, is show some images now with Ben, and he can give us some commentary on each one, uh, how he took these images, and hopefully what he says makes a little more sense now. Uh, from before and it's a good s sample of what can be done with our Olympus cameras and and additional gear obviously that we talked about trackers and maybe light filters or uh, the different techniques of stacking and things like that so let me bring Ben back in mm -hmm. okay hey Ben <laughs> thanks for uh waiting for us I really appreciate that that was a uh, god that was a lot of information um 
And then I had a few more questions, but let's 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 go through these images, and then we'll go to a few questions and Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, I have number five here. All right, so this picture I took at Cherry Springs. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I took that using uh, this lens right here. This is the 12 to 40 millimeter f2.8. And I think I stopped this down to f4 to get rid of the coma. And so this, these pictures, I think, I think they were 60 second exposures each taken just using the camera's inner internal intervalometer. And this was using the original EM1 Mark I. This is before I had the Mark II or the Mark III. Yeah, it's it says here 22 exposures of 60 seconds, 400 ISO. Yes, yes. And uh, I kind of wish I'd used a higher ISO when I was there, but you know, oh well. But it's great because this, this is a very dense part of the Milky Way. We're actually almost looking right into the core of our own galaxy right here. So uh, if Ooh. you think of us being in a galaxy with these spiral arms, we're in one of these spiral arms. Uh -huh. And... The nebulas that you see in front of us here, these pink and blue spots and these dense clumps of stars, those are actually in the next arm over in our galaxy. So we're actually looking into our own galaxy through a, a kind of an empty space. And then there's another arm, another spiral arm that almost all of these nebula and star clusters are in that are in this picture. And then, of course, you can also see there's like a lot of these brown areas. That's dark dust, which is dust that's not really illuminated or emitting any light on its own. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that dust is so thick that we can't see through it at all. You know, there are, you know, we can't see the other side of our galaxy because of this dust. Oops, I'm dark. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. Um, dark dust lanes are actually, uh, it's most photographers, when the astrophotographers, when they, when they're able to capture these really well, you know, the, it's a, it's a, it's a good, chest thumping moment because they're kind of hard to capture unless you're in a dark sky location. However, I have been able to do it under a Bortle five sky, uh, using some of Olympus's faster lenses, you know? Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Wrong. Button. And, oh yeah. We should, I should, let me yeah. tell you what's what in here. So that large pink one that you see is the lagoon nebula. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then just to the left of it, there's kind of like a double looking one. That's called the uh, the trifide, I think is what it's called. And okay. then there's another globular cluster further up there to the left. This one. Yeah. And, and another cool thing about these dark dust lanes is that any of these brown areas, any stars that you see on them, that's, those stars are not in those dust lanes. They're actually on, they're in between us and the dust lane. Oh. So it's, it's kind of a neat way to kind of look, look at the picture three dimensionally and see it as, you know, okay, these are, you know, here's objects that are in front, you know, versus objects that are behind. Huh. So the, the dust or the, the dust is, are they stars or explain that one more time? For that me. dust is basically, you know, kind of like dust in the air, you know, it's, it's, oh. it's across such a vast uh, expanse of space that, you know, you know, you travel several hundred miles before you come along across another piece of dust, maybe thousands of miles. But because, you know, space is so big, you know, it, it eventually piles up to the point where you get enough of them there that are overlapping each other. Huh. You can't even see through it. Wow. I always thought they were just very far away stars, but it's actually dust in this space. Yeah, that, that, that's what those, that's what that dark huh. that dark dust spots are and, and any stars that you see on top of those you know those are stars that are in front of that dust wow okay that's interesting so it is we are looking three-dimensionally here mm -hmm. okay wow yeah and the more detail mm -hmm. you're able to get into this dust you know the more three-dimensional picture looks ah neowise Neowise, okay, what is that, a comet, right? Yes, this was a surprise comet. Nobody expected it to get this bright, but and it wasn't bright for very long. Um, we only had one night at the observatory where it was on the, on the, when it went around the sun, this is when I, I got it, when it went around the sun. Uh -huh. uh, before it went around the sun, I really, I wish I could have photographed this before it went around the sun because I was up in upstate New York, which was a nice dark, a darker dark Bortle 4 sky. And my parents and I saw that thing in the sky. I was like, "That doesn't look like Mercury." You know, I thought it was Mercury, and I just kind of wrote it off. And I, and I should have taken a picture of it because it was it was Neowise. 
Oh, well, but you know, this was at the observatory. I think we had, oh, we probably had 30 people up at the observatory just to, to look at this thing. Huh. It was the only good clear night. And it really wasn't even a very good night. There was a lot of haze in the sky. You, know, right. you can see so a lot of the light pollution at the bottom. Now, the note I see on this, it says 75 millimeters, 12 by 20 seconds, yep. 200 ISO, 16 bit. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the 16 bit is is what I compressed it at after I edited it. But um, uh, mm -hmm. 12 pictures taken 20 seconds each. And I was using my Sky Adventurer Pro and the 75 millimeter F1.8 from Olympus. And this is this is with the EM1 Mark I. Wow, EM1 Mark One with a 75 millimeter lens. Yeah. Again, the, you're not using a fancy telescope. This is, I just can't mm -hmm. believe you got this at 75 millimeters. Uh, this is actually cropped a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, I wish I had the EM1 Mark II when I did this because the EM1 Mark II would have been so much better for this target. Or Mark um, Three or Mark Two. Either one, you know, because these are short exposures. That, oh, okay. Okay. You know, thermal noise isn't that big a deal at 20 seconds. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's so, let us look at the next one. So that, this is only 12 shots. So it didn't take Yeah, yeah. It wasn't very many photographs at all. And mm -hmm. it was really easy to take, you know. Hmm. Okay. This I don't have any notes on, but it looks familiar. Yeah, yeah. We, we looked at this one earlier, too. This, this is Orion. On the okay. left is, they call it the Big Stellar Nursery. And on the right, you see the Running Man Nebula, which it, there's a little man in there that kind of looks this. like he's running. And, uh, yeah, this, what, what's really cool about this is that this is all expanding gas. Okay. And it's, it's dust in space and in the, in the very center of Orion here, that really darkly, that densely packed section of stars, there's a whole bunch of really bright stars in there and mm -hmm. they are what are causing all of this, this reflectivity off of this gas ah. and, uh, that's why we can see it. It's because there's a bunch of really bright stars inside of this nebula. And wow. some of them are kind of hidden behind those clouds and they're causing the clouds to kind of glow. Um, right. But yeah. It, 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 a lot of people call it like the, the flower because, you know, it looks like a, a flower kind of opening up. And Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Huh. Okay. Let's go to the next one here. This is the Andromeda galaxy. You know, so, uh, yeah, fun fact our, our signature this. part of the sky, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so a fun fact about this picture, this is a big object, okay? This is a really big object in the sky. Um, a a 200-millimeter lens is actually enough to start getting a lot of detail on, on Andromeda. I'm using, this is a 400-millimeter lens, right? Okay. And I think this is with the Olympus 100-400 to 400 that they just came out with, actually. Hmm. Yeah, the note I see here is 32 exposures between 60 and 180 seconds at ISO 1600. Yeah, if I remember right, 12 of these exposures were at 60 seconds, and then the rest were taken at 180 seconds. And this was, what was it, ISO 800 or 1600? It's ISO 1600. 1600. Yeah, 1600. This is, this is taken with the EM1 Mark III and... Mm -hmm. Uh, we're actually going to see another picture of the same galaxy taken with an older lens and okay. the older EM. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's the EM1 Mark One. Now flip back. Okay. okay. There's the EM1 Mark III. Okay. So yeah, that's big, huge. Im big improvement, you know. Uh, I'm also using a little bit longer of a focal length, but I'm actually using a slower lens with this picture than I was with picture nine. Okay. Picture nine is, is using a, a lens set to f4. And mm -hmm. then if we go back to picture eight, that's a lens set to f6.3. So and this you know, is 100 to 400, you said? Yeah, this is the this is the 100 to 400 that Olympus just came out with. Wow. And Andromeda is is a huge object. So if you took the moon as it appears to us in the sky, you could stack seven of them along the length of Andromeda. That's how big this object is. Wow. Um, and then uh, tip, did you? Go ahead. I'm sorry, say that one more time. How big is this object? It's if you took the moon and and lined up seven of them across Andromeda, that's that's uh -huh. how wide Andromeda is visually. You know, really? so like yeah, yeah. It's 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 a very big object in the sky. I mean, of course it's it's a gigantic object in space, but you know, it's even though it's very, very far away, you know, it's it's I think it's one and a half billion light years away, it's still monstrous 
it's still bigger yeah. than our moon as it appears to us in our sky. Because I feel like I can almost see this with my naked eye when I was um, younger. You, yeah, when you were younger, I bet you could. You know, <laughs> um, when I was younger, I remember being able to see this thing. It's it's basically a fuzzy patch in the sky, and now you have to go to a dark sky location because there's too much of that darn light pollution. Yeah, yeah. This this is amazing. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, and the and the beauty of this is is that even my 180 second exposures that I was taking those three minute exposures. Uh, even those, the core of this was not burned out because the newer sensor that is in the EM1 Mark III and the EM1 Mark II handles uh, highlights so much better. You know, the, the wells and the pixels are much, much deeper. And so they're able to contain a lot more photons of light before they fill up and start spilling into the rest of the pixels around them. Yeah. Now, now we've now with the interferometer, you're saying there was a limit of 60 seconds, but you have, you've noted here 180 seconds. Yeah. So with this, I actually used an external intervalometer. This is by Pixel Pro. Okay, if you can see it there, and this guy he slides into the hot shoe like this. And now with the old EM1 Mark One, I had to buy a USB adapter that went into the USB port on the camera, but with the EM1 Mark II and the three, there is actually a small two and a half millimeter uh, audio jack on the side, which connects to this thing. And then I have this guy right here. This is actually the remote that runs this. So this allows me to program this thing. I mean, I can do a one hour picture if I wanted to using this. And this is how I take all of my exposures that are longer than 60 seconds. And okay. what I yeah, don't, yeah. Like yeah, I had thing. the same. This is like a forty dollar. Oh yeah, it's real cheap. Thirty thirty five bucks or something like that. Off yeah, Amazon. very cheap. Um, you know, I've I've used it time to time for other stuff like self portraits and mm -hmm. testing things, but it's definitely nice for self portraits when I can get to work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I hate about it though is that it doesn't always take exactly the same exposure length. Sometimes I'll get. Sometimes my exposures will be 180 seconds. Sometimes they'll be 177, 178, really? 179. It, it's weird. Um, is it a problem or is that? Just... Uh, it means that my calibration frames would are not like perfectly going to match it. You know, if the exposures are moving around in length of time, um, mm -hmm. I don't know why it does it. Uh, it's it's kind of an annoyance. Yeah, made in China. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, you know, it's a $35 device, but would you say it's throwing the pictures off by a per certain percentage or is it negligible? Oh, it's or? less than 1% that it's throwing okay. the pictures off, you know. Okay, so we're not we're not wasting our money. We're getting 99% of our functionality. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You know, um, it, and if you want to get more really faint details in the heavens, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to get one of those things. Okay. You know? let's, um, let's Olympus, if you're watching, please make our intervalometer longer <laughs> allow us to do like 10 minute exposures right you know, that would be great yeah i mean why not it's just a software thing yeah yeah it's just a software um, thing okay let's let's uh oops seven eight so that was the m1 mark one with so the 50 again. to 200 f 2.8 f 3.5 and and that lens i had to stop it down to f4 sometimes f4.5 Okay. Um, because it, it has a lot of coma in it. The the mm. 100 to 400 that Olympus just came out with is, is much, much better optically. Okay. Um, well, let's let's talk about lenses after a couple of pictures. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can actually see the coma. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. And the, okay. if you look at that star at the bottom of the picture there, you can see how there's like a, a blue halo around it. It's kind of off-centered like. That's that's the coma starting to it's, it's uh, down here. manifest. Yeah. Okay, so coma is like makes the stars look bigger in the image with some distortion or blue. It, bigger and distorted. They're not going to be round, um, and it they'll mostly manifest themselves in the outer edges of the of the picture. Ah, okay. But let's go okay. on to the next one. Okay, this the note I says here says California nebula nebula ninety nine times thirty seconds f two point eight seventy five yes. millimeter ISO sixteen hundred. Yeah, so I took this in my recent hunting trip up in Colorado. Um, I wish I had done longer exposures with this. 
because <laughs> then mm -hmm. I could have gotten a little more detail. But yeah, the California Nebula is a beautiful hydrogen alpha region, okay? And it's an emission nebula, but even though it's an emission nebula, it's, it's so bright that even a non-modified camera is going to pick it up all right. I was using the EM1 Mark II here because I had to I had to return the EM1 Mark III that Olympus had loaned me, and I hadn't yet received the one that I purchased. You know, I actually I, I begged Olympus to let me just buy the one that they let me loan me, but they didn't, they didn't <laughs> respond. So, because <laughs> um, it would have been great for this particular picture, but on the bottom left there, you can actually see some really dark spots, and those are yeah. that's Oops. that's dark nebula starting to show up there again. That's actually a really popular target right in here. Yeah, and this this location that I was at is uh, it's on the valley floor at eight thousand feet above sea level, and it was a Bortle One sky, it's a beautiful sky, and I the whole eight days that I was there, unfortunately, we had half a night that was clear and it was the first night that i was there so i was outside in about eight degree weather shivering and freezing but i just i could not get myself to go back inside because the sky was so gorgeous and i took this this is using the 75 millimeter f 1.8 and as you can see i've set it to f 2.8 because uh, it does have a little bit of coma in it yeah and then uh yeah 99 pictures and I did that with the built-in intervalometer in, in the camera, as you've seen the 30-second exposures. And, yeah. Uh, so that's um, – so it, it basically it just ran for about an hour. Uh, yeah, just, just about an hour. Yeah. You know. Okay. Because there's always that one-second delay in between, and so mm -hmm. that adds up to about an hour. Yeah. I have a wide-angle shot that I took while I was up there too, but I – I couldn't find it in time to send it to you. Okay. Um, let's talk about this one. This one, the note I says, flame and horse head 15 times 180 seconds, 16-bit recovered. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so while I was taking this one, I was melting my camera lens. I didn't know it. That's why this, this one looks a little blurry. So this is taken with Olympus's 100 to 400 millimeter uh, F5 to F6.3 zoom. Mm -hmm. And I had a dew heater around it. Yeah, actually, somebody asked me earlier, do I use dew heaters? And, and I was using a dew heater on this. This was taken late in the fall, early in the morning. And, uh, yeah, I actually took about 45 frames. But uh, the other 30 were no, just so bad because I, I, had, I had an overheating issue. So mm. this right here is, the, is one of the dew heaters that I use. It's from Protag. They're actually cheap. They're only 20 bucks. And uh, what I did is they plug into a USB port, but you can rewire them for DC or whatnot. I plugged it into my ZWO Air. And unfortunately, it pumped five amps through this thing. And because it, this thing is only rated for two and a half, it melted the dew heater and also my lens. And I came up there as like, what's that smell? Oh. Five hundred and eighty dollars later, this lens was repaired. Oh, yeah, oh and it, it was it was you know a week it was it was right after the lens came out too. Like I was one of the first pre order one of the early pre order people to get it, and oh. and I had to set it back to Olympus for repair. And they're like, "Oh man, we don't even have this in our system to get repaired yet because it's so new." Oh <laughs> man, that's bad. But uh, but yeah, it, it's. It's amazing that I got like this much detail in the Horsehead Nebula, and and once again that Horsehead that you see kind of peeking up into the red, yeah, that, that is what we call dark nebula. It's it's dark dust that doesn't emit any light, and it's on it's in front of um, gas that's behind it that is emitting light, and so it's you know we're just seeing the shadow of it essentially, mm. and then on the left there we, it's the flame nebula which that is more of a reflection nebula. And those really bright stars that you see there, um, there's light reflecting off of that nebula and, and causing that, you to see that yellow that's there. But yeah, this, this picture would be much, much sharper and have a lot less noise in it too if I hadn't melted my lens while I was <laughs> taking this picture. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It, it was, it was, this was taken with the EM1 Mark III that I had on loan from Olympus and I was testing. Okay.
Man, amazing though, still. Amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, what are we looking at here? Looks like Orion or? Yes, this yeah. is Orion. This is M4 Messier object number 45. And I gotta try to think. I think this is made up of 60 and 30 second exposures. So the okay. great thing about the Pleiades, which is what this is, do I have it labeled as Orion? No, it just says M45. Okay, yeah, M45 is the Pleiades. It's it's the seven sisters. Okay. Okay. And this is what's called a reflection nebula, and reflection nebulas are awesome for people who don't have modified cameras because. It's light that's coming from a star and reflecting off of the dust. And so it's going to be full spectrum. Okay. And this is a fairly bright object. Um, even 60-second yeah. exposures are going to start showing you great detail. And if you can get longer exposures, it'll be even better. Now, this is taken with the EM1 Mark I and the 50 to 200 millimeter f2.8 to f3.5. And I think I had this set to f4.5 when I was taking these. And I was using my little sky tracker back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember how many pictures are there. I think there's close to a hundred stacked. So it was a lot of data I, I put into trying to, to make yeah. this look good. Because I can see just a little bit of clouds in there too. Right, right down yep. in here. Yeah, and it's funny because th these gas clouds are not actually part of the stars that we see in this picture that are part of the Pleiades. Uh, hmm. The Pleiades are actually going through this this dust cloud, so to speak, ah. and they're illuminating this dust cloud. More of this dust this dust cloud that you see here, it's actually all over this part of space. You know, like those dust clouds would go into every inch of this um uh, this picture, but mm -hmm. because there's no stars nearby to illuminate this dust, only the ones that are right around the Pleiades are, are going to be visible. Now, you can find some guys online who use really, really long exposures mm -hmm. to bring out the dust that's in the outer regions of this, and it, it's pretty incredible when you see all of it because, you know, it's, it's, it's really a big network of dust that's out there. Wow. Wow. Okay. This one, uh, what's... This looks so, like from the other trip, maybe. There's a lot of dust here. Yeah, so this I took at my parents. This is this is what I was photographing while Neowise was in the sky. <laughs> oh, okay. Because uh, Let me just read the note I see here. It says EM1.1 old, 180 seconds, 400 ISO, 60 to 56 F. I assume that's Fahrenheit at F. That, yeah, so that was the temperature. That was me recording the temperature of the camera while I was taking these pictures. Uh this is like early in the morning, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is taken with the 75 millimeter f1.8. And I th I'm pretty sure I had it. Looks like I had it set to f2, according to my notes. Yeah, it says f2. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a bunch of 60 second exposures stacked together. And down there in the bottom left, you can see what's called the North American Nebula. And it's called the North American Nebula because it looks like North America. Um, you can kind of see the the foot, so to speak. That that uh, you got that black spot there. That's the uh, kind of the Gulf, and then you got Mexico wrapping around. Yeah, you can kind of see Florida there. It, it's it's pretty neat. It really does bear a close resemblance to the North American continent. Yeah, I see it right right here. This is Florida. Oh no no no. Uh, Am I way off? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's the it's the bright pink area. Is, is the this, North this American part. Nebula? Yes, that. So you're uh -huh. you're actually got your hand. There's Texas now. You're into Mexico. Okay. There's there would be like uh, the East Coast of the United States. That's up there in Pennsylvania right now. Ah. That kind of makes sense to you now. I've got it's tipped yeah. sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In this I particular see. view. So if I go this way. Now it's upside down. There you go. Now it's now it's as we would usually look at it on a map. Okay. And then where's my mouse right now? So that'd be Texas right there. And then oh, okay. And then this is like New York. Yep. You're going DC area. And then this is Florida. Yeah, okay. right there. Florida. I get yep. it. Got it. Yeah. All right. Let's uh let's go to the next one here. What's this? Yeah, let, this let me read the notes again. It says EM one dot one. 25 yep. frames, 300 seconds, 65F, 
400 ISO F to 75 millimeters. Yeah, yeah. So these were more pictures that I took while I was up in New York uh, with the EM1 Mark One. Mm -hmm. It's just another section of the sky. Okay. You know, this one has a little bit more noise in it, and I can't remember why. I think it might have been I didn't really, I wasn't really able to get good calibration frames for it. Mm, okay. And then, uh, wow, what's this? This says uh, Orion 45 millimeter f 2.8 flash. Yes. So this this lens, okay, this is taken with the 45 millimeter f 1.8 lens from Olympus. This was loaned to me from them. And if you wanted to buy a lens to experiment a little bit with deep field astrophotography, this is the lens I would recommend if you wanted to go the affordable route, okay, because it's not a very expensive lens and it's fast. Mm -hmm. so yeah this i found at f2.8 it produced really good stars and yeah. this is all taken on a star tracker and i went to the observatory to do these and i can't remember how many i can't remember how many pictures of it i stacked but i i think i was using I think I was using like 15 second exposures and 30 second exposures because okay. at f2.8, the core of the core of Orion, it gets really bright, really, really quick. Mm. And anytime you do any of these wide field shots, if you want to get details in the outer areas mm -hmm. and also get details in Orion, you're going to have to bracket and stack different exposures together because Orion's so much brighter than all the other things that are around it. Okay. This one I have the note says, Orion at Curtis's place, 110 exposures at 30 seconds. Yep. So 1600 EM1 Mark II, 75 millimeters, F2.8, 16 bit. Yes, yes. This was also taken on my Colorado trip. This is one of the other pictures that I had is Orion was starting to come up. And so I aimed it at my, it was one of my favorite parts of the sky. And you can see, you know, the Horsehead Nebula there, kind of on the right, you can see the three stars that make up Orion's belt. This is uh, tipped sideways from what we normally would look at it. Yeah. Um, I just did that to make it bigger on the screen. Yeah. And there's there's kind of like a row of just different objects in this picture. and. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. really, it's a fun section of the sky. You know, if you want to start on a target... Orion mm -hmm. is the target to start. It's it's best shot in the fall and in the winter. Yeah, it's still up there right now though. I mean, uh, it's actually it gets about in the middle of the sky by about nine o'clock right now. Okay, so that, get it before it goes down. <laughs> and let's let's take a second here, because um, we we talked about a couple of things that we didn't really address before. Uh, I, or maybe we did and I missed it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, how are you finding places in the sky to, to shoot? Like, what, what app was that one again? Um, well, I mean, I like, I the Colorado trip was too. just, the Colorado trip was just his backyard because he's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the I use that light pollution map, which is the uh there's a link to that that's going to be down in the description and that basically mm -hmm. gives you a colored map you know i think dark blue areas are tar parts of the area that are dark, right. that are darker and then yellow and into red and into white are yeah the, uh, well that's what, that's for finding a spot to go to but what mm -hmm. i'm asking is like i remember in one of your videos you were able to frame like a 45 millimeter lens to the sky and find certain objects what software is that Oh, uh, was that when I was using the tethering app that Olympus has? It could be. I was because you were trying to find certain objects in the sky to photograph, and you said oh. this software lets me frame it at seventy-five millimeters, or it, you know. Okay, it, that software is uh, it's not it's not in this account. Is that a free online thing? or is Yes, that... yes, it is a free piece of software. It's called Stellarium, and it's spelled S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. Okay, so I type that into the chat for everyone. It's called Stellarium. It's a free mm -hmm. software. Um, 
And I will probably eventually, there's actually other people that have done tutorials on how to use it. You know, you can, mm -hmm. you can type in the dimensions of your sensor, the focal length that you're using, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it'll put a little frame on the screen and you can pan around in the sky and kind of, uh, and, and do compositions and, and kind of plan out, you know, okay, I want to photograph this part of the sky. Is this lens going to do right. it or do I need a different lens? Yeah, exactly. Cause I, and you do have a video where you I are... think I did did it a lot in my forty five millimeter f one point two review. Yeah, where, yeah. You know, it's like oh yeah, this these are some of the things that you can see in the summertime because I think I was doing that review in the winter time and obviously you know there are no winter objects in the sky for me to photograph. So I was like okay, mm -hmm. we could pretend that we're taking pictures. You know, these are kind of some of the things that you'll see. Right, and what time to go? Right, like mm -hmm. you need to put. 10, 10 p.m. to get it right above you, you know? Um, yeah, ideally, the, when it's at the highest point in the sky is when you'd want to be taking your pictures, right. ideally. That has the least amount of atmosphere between you and the stars. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay, good. So Stellarium and then... Um, okay, we'll come back to these other two it's, right after these images. Well, here, I'll, I'll show you one yeah. other thing. So it's not the best solarium is not the best place to find out how bright it is. Um, for when I want to figure out how bright an object is, this is the book that I use the astrophotography sky Atlas. And in it, it's got different charts and stuff. And these charts, they're color coded. So all the red yellows and orange stuff, it would be emission type nebula. And that's stuff that I don't really bother to photograph with my Olympus cure because that requires, a modified camera okay a modified camera will do emission nebulas just fine the reflection nebulas or the planetary nebulas those ones can show up really good on, on a on an unmodified camera let's go to a page that has like here's this right here is actually orion that picture we were just looking at and you can see this large pink area this is a this this requires a modified camera and like in my pictures this doesn't show up very well because I don't have modified cameras and it's all hydrogen gas and you can see some red areas. But if you look around, like here's the witch head nebula, that's a blue object because that's a reflection nebula that will show up great in a, uh, that's a fairly faint object, but it'll show up good in an right. unmodified camera. Let's see if I can okay. find it. Show, show the title of that right on the, oh, yeah. let's see, let's see. Astrophotography Sky Atlas. Okay. And we can find that on Amazon. Or... Yeah. It's not very expensive. And okay. the other book that the same author um, writes is this one right here, The Deep Sky Imaging Primer. Uh, this is actually a really good book to start with. And this is actually the book that I use as a curriculum in the astrophotography class that I teach at the observatory. And if you wanted to get... <laughs> really deep into astrophotography there's this one which i am still about two-thirds through because it is the pages are a lot thinner and the writing's a lot smaller let's put it that way <laughs> okay i'm sorry show that second book one more time this one right here the oh the one that i use for curriculum yeah um that's gonna be this one here it's, it's written by Bracken. Uh, image primer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've emailed and I think I've even talked to this guy on the phone once or twice. He actually lives here in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, let's look at one or two more images and then we'll go right to the Q&A. Or, well, before we go to the Q&A, let's look at one or two more images and then we'll uh, take a few questions. All right. Um, let's see. What is this? All right. So this... Is this, one I'm of the sorry, most... let me read the notes here. It says okay. Scorpio lower, 25 images, 60 seconds, 400 ISO, 16 bit. <clears throat> so if you get to go to a dark sky location and it's in the summertime, your Scorpio is a really easy thing to spot in the sky because it looks like a scorpion. This is the most beautiful and most colorful section of sky that there is. There are blues in this section of sky. There are reds here. There are oranges and yellows. Now, my picture doesn't do this area justice. I was in a real hurry when I took this. But 
And I was also taken with the older EM1 Mark I. Okay, if you're using an EM1 Mark II or an EM1 Mark III or, or even the new EM5, the latest one that came out with a 20 megapixel sensor, those sensors are going to resolve this section of sky much, much better than I was able to here. Yeah. But this, this was just done with the, the 12 to 40 millimeter zoom lens. No kidding. And uh, yeah, EM1. so <laughs> yeah, with the EM1 Mark I at F4, you know, this, and this doesn't require a modified camera. This is a great target to try and shoot once you have a tracker and you can start taking 60 seconds. Yeah, if I could have, I wish I could have done this with the EM1 Mark II. And, and this summer, uh, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna reshoot this. Actually, it's starting to come up in the mornings already. It's pretty high in the sky, and and if we get a clear morning, you know, it, uh, that's on a new moon. I'm I'm gonna run off to a dark sky spot and try to get it. Okay. Because it's great, great target for 50 mil, even a 25 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. On these AP on, on our four thirds cameras, we'll frame this up great. You know, you do not. This is a big, big object. You don't need uh, a very long focal length to see this in the sky with your pictures. Wow. Yeah. I mean, clearly, because the difference in the Andromeda Andromeda galaxy between the M1 Mark III and the M1 Mark I was oh yeah, it was huge, huge, huge difference. And looking at this image, I would I would assume it was the M1 Mark III. It sort of speaks to how vibrant this image could be. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, newer camera. Yeah, and, there was there was a lot of thermal noise in this because it was a it was a hot night when I took it. Yeah. Wow. And I think that was the last. Let me just double check. Uh, where's my folder? Oh, there's one here. Eighteen, nineteen. There we go. Yeah. So this will show us. This is the difference between the EM1 Mark One and the EM1 Mark three of the Pleiades, right. the Pleiades. So let's, let's go to the next picture too. Let's, so yeah, so that, that was the absolute best I could do with my EM1 Mark one using the 50 to 200 millimeter F2.8 at 3.5. Um, that was like, I think a total of four hours of exposure times, you know, 30 second and 60 second exposure stacked together. Wow. And then if you switch back here, this is taken with the EM1 Mark III. And just look at how much better the sensor renders this image. And, and, yeah. and the really awesome thing about this sensor is that not only does it have less noise, but it handles bright stars a lot better. Like these stars are not bloated and huge like they are on my EM1 Mark I. And yeah. And it's it's rendering so, the dust so much better. Like yeah. like that that picture right there. That's taken with half the focal length, and then you switch back to the EM1 Mark III. The stars are almost the same size, even though we're using they're we're twice as close. Wow. Um, and, and sorry, what length? This was the 100 to 400 again. Yeah, this is the 100 to 400 f5 to f6.3. This is taken f6.3 right here, and uh, even though we're using a lens that's one and a half stops slower. I'm able to capture so much more detail. Um, yeah. And this, it says 35 frames at 180 seconds. So it's not even. Yeah. These are three frame. minute exposures. Three minutes. You know, we could even probably get more detail if I went to five minute exposures with this. Right. Right. So, okay. I just, uh, let's, let's go to a few. That's amazing. That picture. Let's go to a couple of questions that I had. And then a couple of questions from the audience. Then we'll just go to a live Q and a. Um, if you have a few more minutes, I know oh, it's yeah. almost two hours. That's fine. But, um, we can go three if we need to. I'm, I'm ready. The, the two questions I got is I noticed you take multiple frames and you have multiple exposure times. That's for is like there a balance between how many frames you take versus how many minutes you take per exposure. If you could explain, explain the correlation there. Yeah. We, we talked a little bit about this last time when we chatted. Um, so every time oh, I'm tangled up here, my headphones, like I said, usually if I'm taking different exposures at different lengths, it's because I'm shooting a high contrast target. Okay. And, and this, this is where also like your ISO choice is going to come in. So if you're shooting a faint object, typically you want to typically by default, I use ISO 1600. 
But for targets that have a lot of contrast in them, in other words, they have really bright cores, and then the outside areas are really faint, those you've got to either use a lower ISO, which would be like ISO 400, is with the other ISO that I use a lot, or you need to use pictures that are taken at different lengths, and then you stack those together, and that essentially gives you a bit of an HDR image, okay? So that, that's why we see, especially with my old EM1 Mark I, I was doing a lot of multi exposure times for different images. And that's because that sensor, the well depths are very, they're very shallow. They don't hold very many photons of light before they spill over. The new EM-1 3 I don't do that anywhere near as much. And for just about all objects, you can just use one shutter speed and one ISO and, and get a really good image. Now, there is a point of diminishing returns when it comes to the number of images that you stack. So let's say if you take one picture of an object, okay, you get so much detail, okay? If you take two pictures of that object and then stack them together, you're gonna get about a 50% increase in the amount of information that's in that image. And if you take four images of that object and then stack those together, you know, we basically square the number of pictures that are, that are being taken then you're gonna get another 50% increase in the amount of detail in that picture. And if we square that number again, we go from four pictures to 16 photos, then you're gonna get another 50% increase in the amount of detail that's in that image. And if we square 16 photos, we go to 256. That's a lot of exposures, okay. At that point, I say once you get past 16 exposures, I kind of, I, I draw the cutoff line at about 30 to 50 exposures. If I'm doing more than 30 to 50 exposures, I just start doing longer exposure times. Because when you go from 16 frames to 256 frames, that's all, that's 200, and, if you're doing 60 second exposures, that's 256 minutes for only, versus 16 minutes for only a 50% increase in the amount of detail you get. Whereas I could take 16 exposures, instead of doing 60 second exposures, I can make those 120 second exposures. And then right there, I get a 50% increase in the amount of detail. So like exposure time and the number of images that you stack, they're like on a logarithmic curve, okay? As you, and it's like a bell curve of statistics, you know, that those tails that come off the bell curve, they go, they get closer and closer and closer to that horizon line, but they never ever touch the horizon, you know, but every single time you square things, you know, it's, it's more and more exposed numbers of exposures. And yet like, you know, you're diminishing increase in returns, so to speak. Right. So, that, that makes a lot of sense. So that's why you really want Olympus to have the intervalometer go beyond 60 seconds because you yes. can take longer exposures mm -hmm. and fewer frames. Yes. Yes. Same results. Yeah. 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 Because I could take, you know, instead of taking 16, 30 or 60 second exposures, I could take 16, uh, 120 second exposures and get, you know, twice the amount of information versus going mm -hmm. to 256 exposures. Right. And then just very quickly, how do you, you mentioned a couple of times where you took, say, 60 exposures, but you threw, you know, half of them away how do you determine which ones not to use for example so deep sky stacker well number one i go through and i look at them all in olympus viewer or workspace i like that piece of software by the way and uh i know a lot of people don't like it as much but um yeah. it's great to look for if an airplane went through your picture uh, okay. or satellites you know the mm. darn elon musk satellites <laughs> uh, they're getting more and more annoying and uh, okay. so those obviously I throw out, uh, but also Deep Sky Stacker, when, you, when you're when you going through the stacking process, the first thing you do is you register your pictures. You click on the register button. Mm -hmm. And when you click on the register button, I think by default, there's a little box that's checked that says it'll automatically stack them afterwards. Well, I deselect that and I just let it register the images. And what the registering does is it goes through and it looks at every single picture and it creates a spreadsheet of information about each picture and what the sky quality, and they're actually in the columns, there'll be columns will start getting populated with information about each picture. And there's a column for sky background quality, 
there's actually a number of value for the, the higher the number, the better the value, the, the sharper the picture is, so to speak. Uh, there's also a how many stars were detected in this picture column. And I will go through and I'll look at those different columns and I'll sort them and the pictures that have fewer stars or that have more background issues or maybe that got a lower value. In other words, the stars are not as sharp in those pictures because maybe either a cloud went by or the mount got jostled a little bit or maybe the mount had some some mechanical issues, you know, had some bumps and stuff in it that uh, caused that particular frame to be less sharp than the rest. And then I, I take all of those that are too low of a quality and I just eliminate them from the the stack set and then I go and I click on the stack button in Deep Sky Stacker and then it stacks only those good frames. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So it's you know that that's really understanding the software and the values that the software is giving you. So here I'll give you a fun sense. fact. Yeah. So if there was a grain of sand, a grain of sand, like what you find at the beach, okay, mm -hmm. in the gears of your of your telescope's mount, okay, that grain of sand, which should be about four thousandth of an inch in diameter, is enough to move your mount the diameter of Jupiter. <laughs> okay, it's about seventy arc seconds. Yeah, and so that's why. That's, that's why when you get more advanced into this you stuff, you start doing auto guiding because you can then watch the sky with a separate camera and make corrections for any imperfection, any piece of dust, any nick of hair or, or lint that's in your gears that causes them to, to not track the sky perfectly. Because, you know, the earth does a really good job at spinning at a very consistent rate. Your mount mm -hmm. does not. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, but the, the astro tracker that you use is, you, you got to keep your gear clean as you can, right? It, yeah. I mean, it, it, those gears are all covered and everything. You usually don't really have to worry about them much, but there are actually tutorials out there to do what's called a super tune. And that's when you take your whole mount apart and you, you clean off all the factory grease and you replace it with higher quality grease and you just make sure it's really clean and then put it all together and make sure everything is tightened down to the exact amount. And I actually did that with the last mount that I had. I had a cheap Celestron CGX, I think is what it was called. Mm -hmm. I hated it because it was awful. But, uh, but I actually super tuned that thing like two or three times. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. where I took the whole thing apart, got all the grease off it, cleaned it, put it all back together again. And each time I did it, it did it performed better. Um, now the the current one that I use here, this is an iOptron 45 Pro, and from the factory, this thing was great. And I've never done a super tune on this thing. This thing, I can almost take a five minute exposure without any guiding with this thing because it's it's very very precise. <laughs> how, how much was that tracker? Uh, I think brand new. These are twenty five hundred dollars, and I bought this used. I I bought it from a guy not too far from here, about two hour drive, for twelve hundred. I think it was. Okay, I mean that's not bad, really. I mean, yeah, compared you know, to like the cost of a lens, that's not bad. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, and and having a mount like that will just you know open this the heavens to you and just it, yeah. it allows you to take those long exposures, which you know gets you the really really faint objects. Now, right now, this guy here, um, you can actually hook a guide camera up to this, and through the USB port here, actually the, the auto guide port right here, you can guide with this, and that will if you want to just stick with something like this a little bit longer and not jump into something big like this you know that's a great way to start with guiding and uh you know kind of really allows you to lengthen your exposures by quite a bit okay so that that leads me to the next, how much was that set up there so so this guy here i think these run between 350 and 400 dollars for the pro kit okay? okay and the amateur one which just has the motor head those I think can be had for around 200 or something. Um, maybe it's 250, you know, okay. it's, 
And if so, if you're shooting with say AM1 Mark III and the 100 to 400, mm -hmm. you would use that tracker with. Do you need that counterweight? Or do, would you get the pro version or just the regular one would work? Okay, so if you're using if you're using the battery grip or any lens that's longer than 45 millimeters, I would say get the counterweight. Okay. okay. Uh, the nice thing about Olympus bodies is that they're small and they're light. And so you could get mm -hmm. away without the counterweight um, even with the 45 millimeter lens, you know. Um, the guys that are using Canons or Nikons, you know, mm -hmm. a 50 millimeter lens is about their limit. You know, anything bigger than that, then, then they need the counterweight. Okay. That makes sense. And then uh, let's back up to this question. Um, I should bring up the questions myself here. Yeah, well, I got this one. It says looking at getting started. So let's 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 go with this one. What is getting without spending a fortune? So we talked about that basic tracker. Um, yeah, so forty. So I'm guessing. Okay, if we read this question, looking at getting started without spending a fortune, what kit would you recommend? What lens? What star tracker? What filter? Okay, there is. Let me think. There's a great tracker out there that is all mechanical. Okay. It actually uses like an oven timer um, to, uh, to track the stars. And I'm going to try and see if I can like actually bring up. Yeah. Darn it, I'm not finding it here. Here is this the Omegon Mini Tracker. Okay, that's a you can get this tracker for between a hundred and and less than two hundred dollars, and you can buy them on Amazon. Mm -hmm. How do you spell that? O M E. It's O M E G O N Star Tracker. Okay, it's an all mechanical star tracker. If you wanted to. To start out with a tracker that wouldn't break the bank, great one to start with. And then obviously, you know, any of the 20 megapixel sensors that Olympus mm -hmm. has now um, would be the best sensor to start with. And then any of Olympus's fixed lenses, which, you know, some of the, the 25 millimeter F1.8 actually is, is a very appealing looking lens. Like that's, I, I did a review recently on the 25 millimeter F1.2. Mm -hmm. And I have to stop both of those lenses down to f two point eight. So really, don't don't buy the the one point two. You know, get the the one point eight if you want to save money. Mm -hmm. Now I still bought the one point two because I use it for, you know, pictures of my kids and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, and then but, uh, uh, how about a how about a pollution filter? Do you think I, we need those still or? Oh yeah, so so light pollution filter, um, STC filters are expensive, but they are they're worth it they're nice um mm -hmm. they make a multi-spectra filter which is what i have and then they make that dual band filter and the dual band filter i would recommend if you are in a Bortle six or higher light pollution area okay, okay. if if you're in Bortle five or Bortle four then you should look at the multi-spectra filter okay Okay. And I think, I think those those filters are expensive, though. I think the multi-spectra is two hundred something, and then the the dual band ones so a little over three hundred. Okay. But then then there's also that little plastic clip, which was up there. Now it's right. The Facebook group guy, right? Yeah, on on Facebook that made that little plastic clip that allows you to, you can take apart a regular one and a quarter inch eyepiece filter and then take that glass and stick it in there. Now that's, that's probably an operation that's not for the faint of heart. And, oh, where'd that go? No, it's okay. People can back up towards the beginning of the stream and see it. Okay, yeah, I, well, I had the device here that you use to take the, uh, the filter out of its actual housing because ideally you want to take it out of its housing, but I don't know what I did with it. So, yeah, don't worry about it. And then this is a very specific question. 
Um, oh, here's the, uh, there's, there's the filter oh. I had out earlier. Okay. And then here is the, that little black plastic right. piece. But you were saying you can't use that on a camera, right? That's for that other special oh. camera. Okay, so the filter in its housing, that's that aluminum housing, you would need to remove the glass from this. And then you could stick it in this. And then you oh. should be able to use it with any camera lens. Okay, okay. I but got if you're going to stick this into your camera and then thread your filter into, into this, right then then i would suggest using a telescope with it and, and by the way since we're talking about like what telescope should i start with for astrophotography mm -hmm. get the shortest focal length you can a 60 millimeter six there's a lot of great 61 millimeter telescopes out there that are great telescopes to start with and they have an image circle with with a focal reducer that, that fits the four-thirds sensor perfectly okay all right so 60 millimeters, because, you, you know, you know uh, well, let's answer this question here by Randy real quick. It's very specific, yeah. I guess. If you're from, if, let me know if you're familiar with what he's talking about there or not. I bought the Move, Shoot, Move. We'll be using Nikon DXF with the 24 mode 2.8 and the EM1X with the 12 millimeter F2. I'm not familiar with Move, Shoot, Move, what that means. Okay. I'm, All right. So, but what do you think about? Oh, I know what it means. Okay. So, oh. if you're not, if you don't have a tracker that can track the sky, like like this guy right here, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're just using the 300 rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, the 300 rule would be the same for both of these lenses that he's listing. So, the 24 millimeter f2.8 or the 12 millimeter f2. And, well, let's see here. So he's going to need to take exposures that are 12 and a half seconds long. That, that's the limit of how long exposure you're going to want to take with those two lenses. And what the move, shoot, move technique is, is you take a whole bunch of 12 and a half second exposures of this guy. And then when the, the sky has moved far enough, you just move and recompose the camera until it's the object centered again. Mm -hmm. Take a bunch more, and then when it, it moves further out of frame, then you then you move the camera again, and you mm -hmm. take a bunch more, and so you, you basically build up enough of these short exposures, so that you can stack them all together. You know. Wow, but twelve and a half seconds—that's pretty short. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, that's that's not that long. You know. It's, yeah. So you'd have to do a lot. I mean, I know some people are happy with the five hundred rule or the four hundred rule. Mm -hmm. You know, my my personal standard is I use the 300 rule. You know, if you wanted to use a long, if, if you're happy, well, let me put it this way. So if you're going to be viewing your pictures on your cell phone or posting them to your Instagram or your Facebook, then you would probably be fine using the 500 rule, which allows you to take a, an exposure that's almost twice as long. You, you would be able to take about a 20 second exposure with both of these lenses then. Okay. okay. Maybe, I mean, you talked, we, we didn't really talk about the, near field or deep sky or wide i already forgot the terminology <laughs> okay but wide field lengths <laughs> so wide field astrophotography is technically anything that's a 600 millimeter focal length and shorter and that's and we're talking 35 millimeter here so your 300 millimeter olympus lens that 300 millimeter f4 that olympus olympus lens that they have that's that's considered wide field astrophotography um now, near field, I'm not familiar. I, I'm I'm just kind of scratching my head. I'm not familiar how that's being used. Uh, well, I guess that seems more like a daytime exposure type. You're not yeah, I, macro, I just made that up maybe because I can't remember exactly what you said. <laughs> okay. So there's wide field. There's there's DSOs, which is deep sky objects. Yes. And deep sky almost everything that we've looked at in in our slideshow today were deep sky objects okay, okay? because we're we're looking at individual nebulas maybe right. some of the only exceptions okay that one picture that i showed you i took at cherry springs with the 12 to 40 millimeter f 2.8 mm -hmm. that was taken at 12 millimeters that's uh 
that would be kind of like a, 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 a strictly wide field photo. There's no, there's DSOs in that picture, but mm -hmm. it's not a picture of a DSO. Does that make sense? It. It's, it's a whole yes. section of the sky. Right, right. You're seeing the forest, not a tree. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. So like uh, the wide field astrophotography people, typically they're putting some object or piece of landscape in the picture with their astro photos. Mm -hmm. You know, that's... Um, that's a different type of astrophotography versus what I do. I do DSO type astrophotography. Right. And uh, it's more challenging type, but it's, it's it's infinitely a lot more rewarding, I think, because, you know, after a while, you know, you, you can see those bridges, those natural bridges out in Colorado, or, or is it uh, it's Utah with stars behind them so many times? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and that that's the other thing. I get a lot of questions about what lens should you get for astrophotography. And, and everybody asks me about like a 7.5 millimeter f2.8, like the Lala, you know, because mm -hmm. they want to get that foreground, like in addition to the, the like the Milky Way kind of going over. Uh, what do you think about wide angle lenses? You know, do you still do a 300 rule or? Yeah, know? for the wide angle lenses, you still need to use the 300 rule because the stars were, will start because with that type of photography, the landscape is not moving relative mm -hmm. to your camera, but the heavens are. So you need to use the 300 rule there in order to, to freeze the sky, so to speak. So we're not taking too long of exposure. Now, what a lot of guys will do is they'll actually let they'll take a picture of the landscape uh with the stars in the background and they'll use that as their reference and then they'll let that section of sky get higher in the sky and mm -hmm. then they'll use the same lens and a star tracker like this to then take long exposures mm -hmm. of that section of sky so they can get all the nebulosity and then they'll superimpose that into their their landscape photo so right. it's a it's a comp, it's a composite photo it's the correct scale okay it's the right size and everything nothing's distorted as far as size goes but uh you won't have the star trails and you'll essence have like you know it, it's two pictures layer on top of each other yeah it's basically a composite so mm -hmm. is there any p particular wide angle lens that you're aware of that you prefer i mean you oh. don't do that normally but what do you like well, I now have the eight millimeter f one point eight. Yes, I, I do want to try soon. Um, mm -hmm. I got this for work actually, because we do a lot of these uh, three sixty interactive panoramas. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I, I got this. And this lens, based on the reviews and this other photos that I've seen from other photographers, this lens is really good, almost wide open. So you don't have to stop this down very hard. It has really good coma correction. And okay. I, I can't wait to use it. This this is an awesome lens to use. The 24 millimeter f2 that Olympus makes, I'm sorry, the 12 millimeter f2 that Olympus makes is another really good lens. Mm. I don't own that lens, but I can I can definitely tell you that that's, any of the fixed focal length lenses that Olympus makes are going to be great great astrophotography yeah. lenses because uh, of the, the this, because there's coma and what 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 are some other issues that you look out for. So, is there any lens you would avoid, for example? Um, well, uh, like I said in my review, the 25mm f1.2 is one that I would not spend the money on that be if I was just going to use it for astrophotography because of the coma and it was really great. Now, I have not tested the 17mm f1.2 that Olympus makes. However, mm -hmm. I can tell you from view, from photos that I've seen of other guys using it, it is excellent. That is that is actually a lens I would highly recommend. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, that that one slipped my mind there, but yeah, that's another lens that I would, I would highly recommend because it's fast. Mm -hmm. You know, and and if you and if you're okay with the coma, you know, you can open that thing all the way up, and then it's really fast. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and he, here's another cool thing. So. If you're doing landscape astrophotography, um, half of the image is not going to have stars in it. And so landscape type astrophotography, generally, I would be more prevalent to open the aperture further and not worry about coma so much because, you know, the bottom half of the picture, which normally would have coma in it, is going to be covered by land, which isn't as sensitive to coma as stars are. So, you know, 
that, that's why you'll see a lot of landscape photographers who do astrophotography at night, they're going to use the widest aperture of that lens. Whereas me doing DSO stuff where I'm just photographing stuff that's in the sky, you know, we tend to be a little more critical. We're worried about the shapes of our stars, especially around the outside edges. Mm -hmm. So, so if somebody wants to buy a, a very cheap Chinese made seven millimeter lens, mm -hmm. Or landscape type stuff the the coma and all of that is not as critical as what you're saying right that the lens defects aren't quite as yeah critical. it's not quite as critical and oh here's another one the rico i think 12 millimeter mm -hmm. lens i've actually used that and that that lens is actually really good um a lot of those chinese lenses that are designed for an aps-c sensor mm -hmm. but they just you know remount them for a four-third sensor um they're actually usually surprisingly good because the coma that's in the outside edges is kind of cropped out ah uh, okay so good surprisingly point. those cheap lenses are, are are actually pretty decent and um i mean i don't spend money on anything other than olympus lenses because the professional work that i do i need to be able to work very quickly and right i don't like having a lens that oh the lens barrel on this one rotates the other way to focus <laughs> you know they're all they all go the opposite direction it seems you know it drives me absolutely nuts so that's that's why my own personal gear i use 100 percent olympus gear for usability reasons because when i'm there with a client or something like that or you know i'm on a time sensitive job for work mm -hmm. i need to be able to like do stuff quickly and not like sit there and have to get out my manual Right, yeah. right. And what about this question I popped up here from Annette? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I was going to look at that. I would definitely prefer the 300. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. That was easy. <laughs> I would definitely prefer the 300 over the 100 to 400. Now, I have the 100 to 400 and not the 300 mm -hmm. uh, because I needed the 100 to 400 for wildlife. And, but I don't know, eventually maybe I'll, if I see a good used 300, I might pick one up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even used, I've seen them for about 2,200. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the 300, even with the extender on it, it's going to be faster than the 100 to 400 is. Mm. And also there are fewer lens elements in it. So you're losing less light that way through reflections off of each glass surface. Right. And furthermore, um, optically it is a little bit better of a lens. Yeah. Uh, the 100 to 400. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's F five at the 100 millimeter focal length, but there is coma when you go to the wider view. Okay. So you will need to stop down to F 6.3 okay. when you're using that lens at its wider focal length at 200 millimeters. You probably need to still be at a 6.3. Uh, basically, I treat the 100 to 400 lens as if it was an f6.3 lens from its widest focal length to its longest focal length for astrophotography. Wildlife, yeah. you know, I, I don't worry about that. Right, right. Okay, let's let's just get a couple more questions, then I'll let you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What's the this one here is a Benro Polaris tripod head that's on Kickstarter. Is you have you seen that or heard about that? Uh, no, I have not heard about that. Is that, oh, wait a minute. No, I think I have seen ad. Is it, is it one that will like, is it supposedly going to track the sky? Is it, will it, you can put a sensor on yourself and it will like track you as you move around. I, I have no idea. I've never heard of it. If that's the one, I would say stay away from it because you can't, polar align it if it's the one that i'm thinking because here's the thing so you want any tracker that you get needs to be what they call german equatorial right so we're going to introduce a term here german equatorial and german equatorial means that these this axis here that can be rotated can also be tilted to map what part of the earth you're on because we're on a sphere okay de depending on how far up north you are versus how far south you are you're gonna have to tilt the head to basically get this axis line in line with the pole of the earth that, that it rotates around because this guy here in order to get your two axes of rotation you rotate here and then also this part rotates all right 
So that's how you get your X and your Y axis, okay? And there is technically kind of a third axis down here, but this we only move to align the X axis, if you will, along with the North Pole. So any, any tracker that doesn't allow you to align to the North Pole along one of its axes, I would stay away from. Okay, and that, and that, that kind of leads into this next question about do you use a laser pointer or what, what do you do to line things up? Uh, this guy has like a reticle in him. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some actually that Omni um, tracker that I, that I posted, that I told you to, to put in the link there. That guy, you can buy a laser pointer to kind of point to the North Pole with. Um, but this guy here, you know, the, the built-in scope is, is what I, I look through and I actually take my phone and I, and I t turn on the screen and I kind of hover it a little bit kind of off to the side here so that it sends some reflections through the eyepiece so that I can kind of see the reticle sometimes. But I only need to do that in a really dark sky. Around here, the light pollution is so bad, I can see the outline of the reticle against the bright sky. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then... Uh... I guess do you, do you have a, do you have a video or anything on your channel about how to align your telescope or camera? Uh, take... Polar alignment? No, I don't. I actually started shooting one. I never finished it. Um, I was okay. going to do one for the ASI Air, which is this guy right here. So when I get this guy, so this right here, this is actually a little Raspberry Pi computer, and. What it does is it uses your imaging camera and it takes a picture of the sky. You just point it approximately to the north and then the telescope will actually rotate the telescope about 40, about 90, 60 degrees, I think is what it is. And then it will take another picture so that it can, in its mind or in the brain of the computer, if you will, it can figure out where the axis of your mount is pointed to relative to where North Pole is in the sky. And then it tells you what how to move your mount around or up or down to line up perfectly with the North Pole. And that is the ultimate way to do it because when you do it that way with what they call plate solving, um, that will give you an extremely, extremely accurate polar alignment. Uh, far, far better than using the little, the little scope that's built inside of, of the Skyview Adventure Pro. And actually, I have been able to do it with this guy use, using this. Like I actually mount this guy onto my Sky Adventure, and and there's actually another guy out there who does a whole he does a whole bunch of tutorials using the Adventure, the Sky Watcher Adventure Pro, and and using the ASI Air Pro to like to do all this stuff. Wow, does that make wow. sense? It's, no, it, it makes sense. <laughs> you know, you, you can get carried away basically, right? <laughs> <laughs> um okay well uh there's just one last question i think here um it's kind of similar to to one i think rick asked about you know what's a what's a what's a basic kit to get started that you're not going to have to replace later I guess. oh bad cheap yeah well the adventurer like the base unit is a good one because like i still have mine like even though i have this really big telescope here i still have my adventure and i still use it um so that's a i think a good solid buy well, let me get it back into the frame here again so when we're talking about the it's just this part right here all the rest of this doesn't come in the kit um if you buy just this unit right here that's a good way to start because that's something that you won't ever have to replace later on um for the cameras uh, i mean really the the em1 mark three is one that you won't have to replace for a long time until olympus comes out with a new sensor um which i think the next one that's going to come out is going to be awesome we'll see i don't know anything about yeah. it yet but um, right right so em1 mark em1 mark three with that particular tracker and yeah, then, a lot of guys like the the EM five or the EM EM Mark EM ten. I'm sorry, EM ten Mark. Yeah, a lot of guys three. like that camera because it's it's small and 
And they're not afraid to modify that one because it's a cheap camera you can get fairly yeah. inexpensively. Okay. Yeah. And you know, then so a 45 if you, millimeter f1.8 maybe, right? Yeah, I, I think the 45 millimeter f1.8 is a really good inexpensive lens to try out. And uh, and it's a lens that, you know, you'll definitely want to use for portraits of your kids, your wife, or yeah. yourself or whatever. And uh, it's, it's just a handy mm -hmm. lens to have. And then I think the second most desirable lens would be that 75 millimeter f1.8 yeah. from Olympus, which is right here Ugh. this guy right here and if you do buy this lens um i would definitely recommend that you get the metal lens hood for it yeah because the metal lens hood gives you something to put your dew heater on so that you can keep dew under control right right okay ben well i think that wraps up most of the questions hopefully i got to mm -hmm. everyone but uh, yeah here's well, this is my uh this is the m1 mark three that i use and this is that 100 to 400 which we've seen take quite a few good pictures with and if you want to know the part that i melted you know it's right here um oh i, I could send you a picture it looks so awful it, oh that's bad you could actually see through the lens oh it melted the plastic so bad wow um, so but, um, they had it back to me pretty quickly, which was great. Yeah, and and the, the the lens heater, whatever you really only need that in the summertime, right? The yeah, just in the summertime, and I was using it in the summertime because there there was a lot of dew that night. And that's actually yeah. why I put it on is because I I went out there and checked. I was like, oh dang, there's all this dew on the lens, and so I yeah put the dew and heater it seems on counterintuitive to me. You you would use a heater in the winter time, but you don't you use it in the summertime. <laughs> Because yeah. of the humidity. Well, well, we're heating the lens, not the camera body. Right. Because um, that that lens element only needs to be two or three degrees above the ambient temperature. And it's it's funny how stuff that's attached to the ground will actually mm -hmm. cool off faster than the air does. And hmm. it's because of that, because your equipment gets colder than the air, um, really quick that is what causes it to do up because you know it's essentially an ice cube then in a really mm -hmm. humid environment of course all the moisture wants to stick to it yeah yeah wow there's so much to think about and that's that's what i want to end this with is mm -hmm. definitely check out everyone ben's channel because he goes into a lot of detail and has a lot of insight about setting up your camera to do astrophotography you know and he explains in a lot better detail than we could do in the stream about using these little heater things. He puts plastic feet on his tripod for different reasons so the, the tripod doesn't sink into the ground as it gets yeah. wet in the ground. And and how he measures the back of the camera, you know, for heat mm -hmm. and the differences. And, you know, it's just so much detail. This is a huge, huge topic, and we've just barely scratched the surface, but I really want to thank you, Ben, for sharing your knowledge that you can in this this brief amount of time, a mm -hmm. couple hours, about astrophotography. It's just, just a wealth of information. Yes, thank and, you. It's been my pleasure. I love talking about this topic. It's yeah, It has and been I, the driving force behind like even my career, really, like my, my choice of art and the industry that I'm in. So Yeah. And it, it just amazed me. And I was so, in, you know, I found your channel when I was, when you did a, did a wish list for Olympus. And I was really impressed with the, with the things that you were asking for from Olympus to put in mm -hmm. the next camera, because they were all very doable. They weren't like just pie in the sky type thing. You had one or two pie in the sky that I think you mentioned, but mm -hmm. You know, they weren't crazy. They were like very doable things. And I hope Olympus was listening and, and taking notes on that video. I hope so too. You know, it's, it's a long video. It's a 30 minute video, but yeah, you know, it's. And it, it's not, it's, I mean, it, it, it was very, very thought, I, really well thought out and Thank very, you. very, uh, you know, the best, the best wish list I've seen from any channel, to be honest, it, because of the, the, the thought that you put into it and the capabilities that the camera can do that mm -hmm. then reason you know and but anyway that's how i found your channel but when i i kind of binged every video on your channel 
and you have lens reviews on there, the 4512, the 4518, uh, um, you know, among others. And then you have uh, lots of videos on, you know, using uh, Deep Sky Stacker. Yeah, and, I want to do a review on the EM1X soon. Yeah. Um, I need to get one from Olympus. And okay. uh, another lens on my, my wish list is probably the, uh, maybe the 17 millimeter F1.8. Yeah. And also that the 40 to 150 F2.8 is another one. I might just out buy that one. We'll see here. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's one a, I want just for my own personal wildlife type stuff. But. Yeah, yeah, because the the 40 to 150 of 2.8, it's good wide open at any focal length over mm -hmm. 100 millimeters. So yeah. that's that's at f 2.8. You know, that, that's a very appealing lens, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So everyone, check out Ben's channel. Subscribe definitely. So you can keep you. keep up to date. He's going to be cranking out more videos on lens reviews. You know, we all like to talk about gear, but there's a lot of there's a lot of videos on there about astrophotography that'll get you thinking uh, well beyond that. And you can apply, I think, some of these things to normal photography to some extent. Mm -hmm. But it really you'll really get a deep understanding of the limits of your camera for any kind of photography if you do astrophotography because it's the most yeah. technically challenging, I think type of photography and it's nice to have your channel here as a resource astrophotography is the most uh challenging equipment wise of any type of photography that there is you know the level of precision that is required to render stars correctly because a star is an infinite point no matter how much you magnify it it's still an infinite point yet it's on a pitch black background yeah. And if your lens doesn't resolve that correctly, uh, it's just going to look awful. And that's actually one of the reasons why I like Olympus gear is because their lenses are good. They're solid. Yeah. They're, they're much better than any of the other manufacturers out there that I've tried. And yeah, and, and yeah, like it's, said, it's a it's, tough, the, you tough. know, and you talked about other advantages about, you know, the using an external power bank instead of the batteries mm -hmm. and camera. I mean, there's so many fine details to give you that just that little bit better image, you know. So there's a lot of tips very specific to our Olympus cameras on his channel for doing astrophotography. So, okay, we need to wrap it up. Thanks, thanks again, Ben, for being here. Hopefully, Thank you, we can have you on again at another point. Maybe when it gets a little warmer, we can talk about doing astrophotography in the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go camping. Uh, yeah, awesome. Because like I said, you're only a couple hours away, so maybe mm -hmm. we'll get together and do this again soon. So. Everyone, thanks for joining us today, and um, we'll see you guys again maybe on Tuesday. <laughs> All, All right. right thank then. you, Rob. All right. Take it easy, Ben.